Chapter 61 Fourth Year November Part 1 Don't forget I need a three-page essay on the similarities and differences between Thunderbirds and Phoenixes on Friday at the latest, Professor Ferox called out. No excuses! Mary and Marlene groaned as they packed away their things. I completely forgot about that, Marlene whispered. I've got practice almost every night this week. We've got that Ravenclaw match on Sunday. I'll lend you my notes, Remus replied, carefully blotting his paper. It's really easy. Sunday's Sirius's birthday too, isn't it? Mary asked thoughtfully. Yeah, how'd you know? Well, we did sort of go out last year, Mary said haughtily, tutting at Remus. And you lot always make such a massive fuss over birthdays, it's pretty hard to forget. God, I hope Gryffindor win or he'll be in a right mood. Yeah, Remus agreed. He hadn't thought about that. He'd planned to reveal his big prank plan on Sirius's birthday in lieu of a proper gift. Now he wondered if he ought to buy something as well, though they weren't due in Hogsmeade for a few more weeks. He could always give Sirius a pack of cigarettes, but that seemed a bit cheap, especially as Sirius knew they were stolen. Andromeda had already sent some presents ahead, care of the Potters, and James had hidden them under his bed. More records, of course. Remus dearly hoped that one of them was the new Bowie LP, Diamond Dogs. I'm off to the Owlry. Need to send something to Darren, Mary said as they left the classroom. Coming, Miles? Marlene looked a bit put out, so Remus said quickly, I'm going to the library if you want to get those notes. Yeah, thanks, Remus. They said goodbye to Mary and began walking in the opposite direction together. Remus liked Marlene a lot. She was tall for a girl, and he didn't have to crane his neck to talk to her all the time. Other than her emotional outburst at the end of their third year, she was also very much a no-nonsense kind of person, which Remus found very calming compared to Mary, who was always a lot of fun, but sometimes very full-on. Thanks, Marlene grinned at him. I love the girl, but there's only so many times I can proofread her dirty letters to Darren. Dirty letters? Remus gaped. Marlene laughed. Yeah, it's pretty horrendous. Remus, can I ask you something? What? Um, does Sirius like me? Remus fought his initial reaction, which was one of despair. It felt as though he hadn't got through a week of the new year yet without having to listen to someone's romantic problems. Why did they all think he was the best person to talk to? When had he ever given the impression that he was remotely interested? I don't know, he said, hoping he didn't sound too annoyed. You'd have to ask him. I don't think he'd give me a straight answer, Marlene chuckled. Sorry, it's just he's been acting really weird around me during Quidditch practice. Weird? Yeah, just comments and stuff. It's a bit annoying, really. I don't really fancy him as much as I used to. You know, he's such an attention seeker. He's always much more Mary's type. What comments? Stuff about me giving him a kiss for luck or something. Maybe it's just his idea of flirting, or maybe it's a joke. You never know with James and Sirius, do you? It suddenly dawned on Remus what was going on, and he was half angry, half embarrassed for Sirius. What? Marlene said, stopping just outside the library. What's that face for? Er, uh, Marlene. Look, I'm really sorry about this, but... And he explained to her all about the bet. Okay, yes, yeah, she was quite likely to tell Mary, and Mary was extremely likely to tell everyone else in their year, but this would serve the boys right, in Remus's opinion. He took a distinct pleasure in ruining Sirius's chances at winning the stupid bet. Fortunately, Marlene was a very sensible girl, and by the end of Remus's explanation, she was giggling. That makes so much sense, she said, wheezing. James kept trying to stop Sirius from talking to me and everything. Those boys are completely ridiculous. Yeah, Remus grinned, relieved that someone else shared this opinion. Oh, great, now I can have some fun with this, Marlene smirked as they entered the library, lowering their voices. She then added a little wistfully. Shame James hasn't tried it on. He might have a chance. Remus raised his eyebrows. Well, he's only got eyes for Lily, so... Marlene sighed. That's a losing battle. Still, never mind. They settled down at their favourite desk, which was near the biggest window, and provided some nice natural light. 
Remus pulled out his notes and showed Marlene how he'd listed all of the qualities of Thunderbirds, then Phoenixes, then how he'd begun to compare the two. Grateful for his help, Marlene offered up her astronomy notes, and the two of them spent a companionable hour scribbling away. Eventually, it became time for dinner. Remus, Marlene said quietly as they finished up, were all the marauders in on this bet, or just James and Sirius? Er, I think Peter's doing it. He might regret it a bit now, though. So you're not? No, he replied a little bit more loudly than he meant to. Shame, she said, her eyes twinkling. Because I bet you could win. She snorted. As if. Girls like you. You're really nice and kind and clever. Shut up. I'd snog you. Oh, my God, Marlene! Remus started walking a bit faster, his ears feeling very hot. You're my friend! Yeah, but just to win the bet. She grinned, matching his pace. He forgot how athletic she was, and he still had a dodgy hip. Isn't there anyone you fancy? No, come on, I'm hungry. It wasn't a lie, Remus thought to himself. It sort of felt like one, though. Go, go, Gryffindor! Go! Remus chanted along with everyone else. Having Peter wildly waving his scarf over his head like a lunatic with a knitted lasso helped mitigate any embarrassment Remus might have felt for himself. He was nervous, though. More nervous than he'd been for James and Marlene's first game. Because Sirius, while he was very good at flying, did not always make the best decisions under pressure, and Quidditch was a dangerous sport, if you were reckless. Half the crowd was decked out in blue, the other half in scarlet, and a deafening cacophony of boos and cheers erupted as the two teams walked on to the pitch. James was visible as ever with his wild mess of hair, and from a distance the two Gryffindor beaters were the same height, distinguishable only by their different coloured ponytails poking out under their helmets, one flaxen, one black. Remus felt his heart in his mouth, as the players mounted their brooms, squatted slightly, then launched into the air at the blow of the whistle. It was hard to know who to follow, as James zipped up and down the pitch like a lightning bolt in pursuit of the quaffle, while Marlene and Sirius split off, covering different ends of the pitch, bats aloft. The two beaters had very different styles. Marlene was focused and tended to tail the players rather than the bludger in order to better protect her teammates. Sirius favoured a different tact going directly after the offending balls no matter where they were and knocking them as far away from the game as possible. This is Black's first game and he's obviously throwing himself into it, the commentator's voice echoed over the crowds. He's no doubt received plenty of coaching from Potter, who's just scored the first goal. That's Gryffindor in the lead, with ten points. Remus was too anxious to cheer along with everyone else, getting dizzy trying to follow all three of his friends in the air. As I was saying, the commentator, a seventh-year Hufflepuff, continued, lots of talent on the Gryffindor side this year. Potter, of course, and McKinnon, who's one of the best beater the Reds have had in years, and now Sirius Black, the black sheep of a bona fide Quidditch dynasty. You'll remember his cousin, Narcissa Black of Slytherin, one of the finest seekers Hogwarts has ever seen, and of course the younger Black brother, Regulus, who has taken Narcissa's place for a season as chaser. Rumour has it there's bad blood in the Black Clan, so you can bet that the Gryffindor-Slytherin matchup next term is going to be... If you would please focus on the game currently in progress, Miss Darcy, McGonagall snapped over the megaphone. Sorry, Professor. So that's Dunelm of Ravenclaw in possession of the Quaffle. She shoots, she... Oh, and it's a bad miss. The game went on, and Remus hoped that Sirius hadn't been listening to the commentary. Bringing up the Black family was a surefire way to break his concentration. But no, all seemed well. He was hitting the bludgers with a bit more vigour, but that could have just as easily been adrenaline. By the end of the game, it became evident that Remus's concerns were for nothing. Sirius may not act as though he took Quidditch seriously off the pitch, but clearly having a cheering audience did wonders for his concentration. Once the Gryffindor seeker caught the snitch, ending the match on a 300-110 in Gryffindor's favour, the two beaters flew to the ground. Remus saw Sirius throw a gallant arm round Marlene's shoulder and lean in, only to be dodged deftly as she offered her cheek for him to kiss. The common room was a riot of red gold in rock music that evening. 
The whole house came out to celebrate both Gryffindor's victory and Sirius's birthday. Remus, for what it was worth, sold more cigarettes than he had all year so far. He'd come prepared, assuming correctly that the older students would be drinking, making them more inclined to pay up for a hit of nicotine. He himself stayed away from any suspicious-looking drinks, remembering his hellish hangovers from the summer. Sirius and James were in their element, of course, roaring with laughter and soaking up all the congratulations from their classmates. Peter hung about close enough to enjoy the limelight, but not so much as to get in the way. Remus was happy to watch at a distance, chatting with Lily and Mary, and enjoying the snacks brought up from the kitchens. He knew he would not get a chance to divulge his plan until much later, but that was okay. Better for everyone to enjoy themselves. There was plenty of time yet. At some point, Sirius finally got around to opening his presents, a broom repair kit from James, a lot of chocolate from Peter, and from Andromeda, no less than three brand new albums. Dark Side of the Moon, Country Life, which had an incredibly rude cover that all of the boys smirked, passed around, and made Remus want to die from embarrassment, and Diamond Dogs. Who? Remus said, unable to contain his excitement as he held the much-awaited record in his hands, stroking the bizarre, nightmarish artwork. Put this one on first, please? Sirius grinned. Anything for you, Mooney, and settled the disc into place on the turntable. The record player howled, sending a shiver of shock down Remus's spine, the cry of a wolf. He stared up at James and Sirius in alarm. They looked as surprised as he, though Sirius broke into a smile as David Bowie's voice filled the room as if speaking an incantation. And in the death, as the last few corpses lay rotting on the slimy thoroughfare, the shutters lifted in inches in Temperance Building, high on Poacher's Hill, and red mutant eyes gazed down on Hunger City. The whole common room was uncomfortably quiet as this grim, ugly poem was recited, not quite sure where to look as dogs howled and whined in the background. It made Remus feel dark and dirty, but he thought he liked it, as if it were Bowie speaking directly to him, especially as the final lines were yelled out, This ain't rock and roll, this is genocide. A whole month, Sirius whispered loudly. Thirty days, yep, James replied in the same stage whisper. If we do it over the summer... You forgot the silencing spell, idiots, Remus called out. Bugger! Lots of rustling. It was well past midnight on the day of Sirius's birthday, and the party had long since been broken up by the prefects. The marauders had climbed the stairs to bed, sleepy and excitable, but apparently James and Sirius had had a second wind and were now in private conference in James's bed. Remus had a pretty good idea what they were talking about, but had decided to leave them be for now. See how far they took it. Still, he knew they'd realised they'd forgotten the spell eventually, and decided honesty was the best policy. Remus and Sirius poked their heads out from behind their respective curtains at the same time. Sorry, Mooney. Sirius grinned. Did we wake you? Nah, Remus shrugged. I was... Actually, I was thinking about this prank. Prank? James's head joined Sirius's in the gap between the curtains. Who said prank? Remus smiled shyly. He thought he might have to wait until next weekend to tell them, but James magnanimously opened the bed curtains further. Please, Mr. Mooney, he said, step into our office. Eagerly, Remus scrambled out of his own tangle of bedsheets and padded barefoot across the chilly bedroom floor into James's bed. He felt as though he'd been waiting four years for an invite. Well, James asked seriously, pointing his wand light at Remus like a microphone. Tell us! Just a second. Remus rolled his eyes, withdrawing his own wand. Muffliato! He's too clever for us, Sirius said dryly. Indeed, James agreed. Remus ignored them. They were jumpy and silly from lack of sleep. He had to at least give them the gist of his plan before they finally crashed. Remember how I was telling you about Matron's alarm clock? He asked them quickly. The boys nodded obediently, like cocker spaniels. And how we used to fiddle with it, so we didn't have to get up early any more. More nodding. Well, I was thinking about how it could be applied to Hogwarts. I did some research, and... Did you know that all the clocks at this school are controlled by one master clock? The big one outside the Great Hall? Mooney! Sirius cried, suddenly throwing himself at Remus, flinging his arms round him with such force that they both toppled backwards onto the bed. 
Startled, Remus tried to push him away, but Sirius held fast, pretending to sob into his shoulder with joy. You've read Hogwarts a history! One of you has finally read it! You're now my favourite marauder! Gear off, Tosser! Remus growled, finally forcing him off and shoving him further away on the bed, James laughing at both of them. No one would ever guess you're the oldest, Black, James grinned. Mooney, please continue. The big clock. Right, yeah. Remus straightened his nightshirt, feeling very hot and flushed from the assault. Um, um, uh, so I had this idea. It was no good. He'd completely lost his train of thought. Now all he could think about was what an irritating idiot Sirius was. The big clock controls all the others, Sirius filled in, quickly, remarkably lucid now. It's a spell that makes sure every clock and watch in the castle is perfectly synchronised. Even the ones we bring in from home reset. Even muggle clocks. It's a bloody good bit of magic. Yeah, Remus nodded, getting back into the flow. Yeah, exactly. So I'm thinking, if that clock goes wrong, all gets moved by five minutes, then so do all the others. And it would affect lesson times, meals, and pretty much the whole running of the castle. And if we started really slowly... Say, moving it forward five minutes a night. No one would notice for ages. Would they? I mean, how could anyone notice if all the clocks are the same? He finished, sitting back and looking at James, because he was still annoyed with Sirius for flustering him and almost spoiling it. James's brain was working at warp speed. Remus knew this because he pushed his glasses back up on his nose. Finally, he looked at Sirius and smiled. Our Mooney has done it again! Chapter 62, Fourth Year, November, Part 2 Monday, 4th of November, 1974 I don't know, Peter said, wringing his hands again. Professor McGonagall says we shouldn't mess about with time. We won't be, Sirius groaned, having explained the plan twice. This is a muggle prank, Peter. Get it through your thick skull. Don't. Remus frowned, feeling sorry for Peter, who'd been skulking all day because he'd been left out of their nighttime planning. We're not messing about with time, Pete. We're just messing about with clocks. Peter looked at Remus, then at James for confirmation. Okay, he said slowly. I think I get it. They'd agreed to do it as soon as possible and struggled to get through their lessons that day with the mounting anticipation for their devious scheme. Remus had to shush James and Sirius more than once when their excitement got the better of them. They were hardly subtle at the best of times. It won't work if everyone else knows about it, Remus hissed at lunch when Mary asked what they were whispering about. So shut up! I know you lot can keep a secret if you really try. They could hardly wait for night to fall and the castle to grow still and quiet. It had been a long time since they'd all been out of bounds together after dark, and even though it was a very simple task, all of them wanted to go. There was just one problem. It was much more difficult to get all four of them under the cloak than it had been three years ago. Peter, you stay here, Sirius said after their third attempt. Why me? Peter protested. Why am I always the one left out? We're not leaving you out, idiot. This is purely a logistical concern. Sirius rolled his eyes. James! I'll stay, Remus offered. I'm the tallest. It's my fault. But it was your idea, Sirius whined. You can't miss out, Remus shrugged. There'll be lots of times. We're going to do this more than once. Even with three, it's a squeeze, James said. Black, Pettigrew, sit this one out. Why me? Sirius and Peter both cried at the same time. Because, James said, lips curling. It's Mooney's idea and my cloak. It took a little more squabbling, ego massaging, and many promises that every night they would take it in turns, just to be fair, before the two rejected marauders conceded. Soon afterwards, Remus and James were creeping through the Gryffindor common room under the cloak, tiptoeing past a few sleeping seventh years, lying unconscious on their N.E.W.T. textbooks. Hopefully they'll stop squabbling if we give them an hour alone, James whispered as they left the portrait hole and entered the dark, empty corridor. Why is Sirius being such a dickhead to Peter anyway? Remus asked, his own voice as low as possible. 
They didn't want to disturb Peeves, or even worse, Mrs. Norris. All the girls know about the great snogging race, James replied, moving slowly so that Remus could keep pace. Sirius thinks Pete told them. Why would he do that? You know, Black, James said with a smile in his voice. Love's jumping to conclusions, usually the wrong ones. You don't think it was Peter, then? Remus asked innocently. Mooney, James snorted. I know it was you. Ah, doesn't bother me, James laughed quietly. If anything, it's improved my chances of winning the bet. Marlene offered to snog me, Remus said suddenly, but I told her I wasn't in the bet. He wasn't sure why he'd chosen to tell James, or why he'd pick such an inopportune moment to do so. He supposed he just wanted someone to know. Maybe it was a boasting thing. They were the ones who hadn't included him in the running in the first place. Ah, James said. Don't tell Sirius, he'll never get over it. She'd snog you, Remus added charitably. She told me she would. Alas, it's not to be, James replied casually. Remus was thoughtful for a little while, but they'd reached the clock now at the bottom of the grand staircase. It was very big and very beautiful, with a vast mahogany frame carved with various magical creatures and plants, the face and hands cast in shimmering gold. Remus pulled out his wand and concentrated carefully on unbinding the protective charms placed there by a great wizard long ago. It took a long time. They were complex and intricate, braided together fine as lace. But slowly and surely, one by one, he felt the magic unfasten with a gentle pop somewhere in his midsection. He smiled at James. There we go. James waved his own wand at the clock, and the longer hand rolled backwards five minutes. He looked down at his own watch, and they both saw it synchronize. James chuckled under his breath. See, Mooney, I knew it had to be you. Come on, better get back. They crept back up the stairs, quicker now, giddy with triumph. At the top, Remus had to pause for breath for a moment. He rested a hand on James's shoulder to steady himself, and the other boy waited patiently. Hey, James. Yeah? Are you really going to lose that bet to Sirius for Lily's sake? James's back stiffened slightly, but he didn't sound annoyed. Might not lose. But Lily's never going to... I'm the one taking divination, not you. Yeah, but she hates you. She doesn't hate me, James chuckled. Lily Evans doesn't have a hateful bone in her body. Remus said nothing to this, knowing it was quite true. James continued. It's just not time yet, that's all. But I don't mind. Oh, Remus said. It struck him for the first time that James didn't simply fancy Lily. It was something else altogether. Remus wanted to ask more questions, but he didn't know how. He wasn't serious. He couldn't be that brazen. When they got back to the bedroom, Sirius was pacing the floor and the curtains were drawn round Peter's bed. It could be assumed that they had not used their time to settle their differences. Well, Sirius barked eagerly as James and Remus threw off the cloak. Done, James said simply, yawning and heading for his own bed. He patted Sirius on the shoulder as he passed him. Enjoy your five-minute lion. And so the prank went on. Every night that week, two marauders would creep downstairs under the invisibility cloak and perform the spell to move the minute hand back by five degrees, so that by Saturday morning, every clock at Hogwarts was were running 25 minutes late. So far, no one seemed to have noticed, and James and Sirius were getting restless. The thing is, Sirius yawned over breakfast, sleepy-eyed in his rumpled Quidditch kit, we're not actually getting half an hour's sleep, are we? We're not going to bed any earlier. Well, no, that wasn't the intention, Remus said, attempting to construct a marmalade and raspberry jam toast sandwich. Still, I think we ought to get something out of it. The satisfaction of a job well done, Remus responded dryly before biting into his creation. Sweet fruit jelly oozed from between the crusts, getting all over his fingers. Sirius grimaced. He had an aversion to sticky things. The brilliance of their own genius was apparently not enough for Sirius, however. The next morning, Remus woke up long before his alarm rang, and when he checked his bedside clock, he saw that it was apparently still 7am. He went over and shook Sirius. What did you do last night? Remus asked once Sirius finally woke up. You and James did the clock, didn't you? Fancied bit more of a lion, that's all. How much did you move it by? I don't know, an hour or two? 
What? What? Sirius looked genuinely surprised. Isn't that the whole point of the prank? Well, Remus sighed. What was the point? It couldn't go on forever anyway. That's still too much. I'm going to go and see if I can't turn it a little forward tonight. Sirius shrugged, rolled over, and went back to sleep. A few people commented on how odd it was to wake up in broad daylight in the winter at seven o'clock in the morning, but it was a Sunday anyway, Remus thought. They'd probably got away with it. That evening, Remus and Peter crept downstairs as usual, and Remus tried to correct Sirius's recklessness. Can we make it so that we get up earlier next Saturday? Peter asked uncertainly. Remus wasn't sure that Peter fully understood what they were doing. Don't see why not, Remus shrugged. Why do you want to get up early, though? It's a Hogsmeade weekend, and I was going to meet... Um, well, nothing. Who? Please don't tell James or Sirius. Who, Pete? Desdemona Lewis. Oh, no, I won't tell anyone. Remus went to bed with a heavy heart that night. He felt he'd lost every one of his friends now. The only one who didn't constantly want to talk about their relations with the opposite sex was Lily, and he felt a bit guilty around Lily since inadvertently ruining their potions project. To be fair, everyone's in the class had been ruined. Oh, dear! Professor Slughorn had scratched his head, completely confounded by the useless girding potions everyone had produced. Did everyone leave them to brew for the correct amount of time? It must be precisely twenty-four hours. Everyone had, of course, or thought they had. It really was Sirius's fault, Remus reminded himself. Sirius, of course, found the entire episode immensely amusing, and it only inspired him to take even greater risks. The problem was, Remus couldn't catch him at it. Every time it was Sirius's turn to go down and change the clocks, he made sure he was going with either Peter or James, and whenever Remus volunteered to go, Sirius took a step back. I know what you're doing, Remus told him when they woke up one morning with the sun already at its highest point in the sky. And I know what you're doing, Sirius replied with a grin. Goody two-shoes. It was true. Remus was going down every second night and trying to fix whatever havoc Sirius had caused, so that by the third week of November, the clocks were all swinging wildly this way and that, sometimes altered by as much as four hours. The main problem was that Sirius wouldn't tell him how much he was changing the time by, so Remus was having to guess at his corrections. What the hell is going on? Mary said one morning at breakfast after perhaps only four hours sleep. Remus regretted that, but it had been the only way to reclaim ground in Sirius's ridiculous tug-of-war. Breakfast had been a very odd event. It seems that the house elves in the kitchens were more confused than anyone else about the time of day, and were in disagreement over which meal they ought to be serving. As such, scrambled eggs were being served alongside mashed potato and gravy, leg of lamb accompanied cornflakes, and once or twice everyone had arrived for dinner and nothing at all had appeared. Sirius and James were loving every minute of this, of course. "'What do you mean?' James asked nonchalantly. Sirius was not speaking that morning, only yawning and occasionally scowling at Sirius. "'Isn't anyone else sleeping really badly?' Mary asked desperately. She was beginning to look quite frazzled. Her dark hair was coming out of her braids in thick corkscrews, and her eyes were slightly bloodshot. "'And what's up with the weather?' "'Yeah, it was really dark yesterday,' Marlene yawned. "'But today it started getting light at six or summit. Hogwarts is a very mysterious and magical place, James said. Who are we to question its inner workings? Meanwhile, Remus was very concerned about the upcoming full moon. He thought it was Dune Sue anyway, but he couldn't really be sure. If Sirius didn't slow down, he might lose track altogether and just have to lock himself in the Shrieking Shack for a week. He didn't know how to explain that to Madame Pomfrey, but if he didn't do something, then he ran the risk of transforming somewhere in the castle. Wednesday, 27th of November, 1974. By the fourth week, Remus didn't think that any of the marauders knew what on earth the time was supposed to be, even in the vaguest sense. He'd given up trying to correct Sirius at all, and instead thought it best to just let things play out. Finally, things came to a head when, while yawning their way through a transfiguration lesson, Peter suddenly looked out the window with a gasp. What is it, Pettigrew? McGonagall snapped. She'd been much more irritable than usual. 
Actually, everyone had, and Remus resolved never to muck up anyone's sleep pattern again. N nothing Peter looked down hurriedly. But it was too late. The whole class, including McGonagall, was now staring out the window too, and watching the sun rise at eleven o'clock in the morning. Oh, for goodness sake, McGonagall said. Class, I want you all in the Great Hall at once. I'm getting the headmaster. Less than an hour later, Remus was feeling extremely nervous, surrounded by the rest of the school, as they waited for Dumbledore to address them. He hadn't seen much of the head teacher that year. The old man was often absent from meals now, and McGonagall had said he was simply out on business for the ministry. Still, he was here now, and Remus couldn't stop the sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach as the white-haired wizard approached the lectern. "'What's going on, do you think?' Lily asked Remus. Mary was snoozing on her shoulder. "'No idea,' he replied, hoping he'd sound convincing. "'It seems,' Dumbledore began. He spoke very softly for a teacher, Remus always thought, but somehow everyone fell quiet anyway. "'That we have some pranksters in our midst.' At once, everyone in the room turned to look at Remus, Sirius, James and Peter. Remus just kept staring ahead, ignoring them. Peter began to shake his knee anxiously, glancing at James, who smiled back at his audience in an affable manner. Remus couldn't see what Sirius was doing, but it was sure to be ridiculous and highly disrespectful. Still, Dumbledore made no accusations, only smiled pleasantly and continued. "'Rest assured that the clocks are now being corrected, and measures taken to ensure that this cannot happen again. In the meantime, I think we all could do with a bit of rest. I am cancelling the rest of today's classes, to be resumed at our usual and correct time tomorrow morning.' There was a collective murmur of appreciation at this news. "'Yes!' Sirius hissed. Result! Now, Dumbledore raised his arms. Off you go. Use this time wisely. Everyone in the hall got to their feet and began to trudge wearily toward the doors. The marauders were just about to follow suit when McGonagall appeared behind them, placing a hand on Sirius and James's shoulders. Wait, she said. Not you four. Remus gulped as the rest of the school vacated the room, until it was just the four of them, Dumbledore and McGonagall. So, Dumbledore smiled kindly, which one of you came up with the idea, or was it a collective effort? The four boys looked at each other, then down at their laps. Dumbledore chuckled. Admirable, he said approvingly. Then we shall have to treat you all equally, hmm? I think ten points each from Gryffindor. Do you agree, Professor McGonagall? At the very least, she nodded. Detentions? I shall leave that in your capable hands, then. Just one thing, boys. They all looked up, wincing as they braced themselves for the telling off. You are all clearly very gifted wizards. Dumbledore continued to smile. Peter gave an odd sort of squeak. That much is clear. It was a simple spell, yes, but highly effective. That kind of thinking will take you far. But perhaps a little more forethought and planning next time. You might not have been discovered so quickly. Three weeks isn't bad, Sirius blurted out. James kicked him, but Dumbledore laughed. McGonagall turned red with anger. Then I think it'll be three weeks of detention, Black. Sirius quickly bowed his head, and James muttered under his breath, Idiot. Chapter 63 I'm torn between light and dark, where others see their targets, divine symmetry. Should I kiss the viper's fang, or herald loud the death of man? I'm sinking in the quicksand of my thoughts, and I ain't got the power no more. Wednesday 4th of December, 1974. They were all given three weeks' detention with McGonagall, which meant lines and extra homework, and were banned from Hogsmeade until the new year, much to Peter's horror. Poor Miss Lewis would have to wait. This also meant that Remus wouldn't be able to buy any Christmas presents for his friends, but he was grateful for that excuse. He'd so far amounted a small fortune in his eyes, anyway, of ten galleons and twelve sickles. 
It wasn't anywhere near James's inheritance, of course, or even Sirius's bequeathal from his uncle, but it was more than Remus had ever had, even in muggle money. He'd already started making plans for the moment he turned seventeen. Learning how to apparate was key. He had to be sure to get that right. Then he would buy enough supplies and begin his search, and he thought he knew where to start. This term, ever since he'd been back at Hogwarts, Remus had been reading the Daily Prophet cover to cover. He borrowed James's copy and made notes privately, usually in the library, where the other marauders wouldn't bother him. He was looking for anything, attacks, sightings, rumours, anything related to werewolves or unidentified dark creatures. There was very little in there. James maintained that this was because the Ministry didn't want to frighten anyone. But there were still clues. Sometimes there were stories about auras breaking up illegal gatherings or meetings, always in distant, far-flung places, the Outer Herbrides or the Brecon Beacons, and they were always the night before the full moon. This was solid evidence as far as Remus was concerned. Greyback was gathering followers, and no one else seemed to care. Even the Auras were being casual about it, just like they had been with Lyle. By early December, Remus was concerned enough to consult Ferox. This year's Care of Magical Creatures syllabus had proved to be just as fascinating as the years before, and Ferox's dedication to teaching had not waned. He'd even hinted at bringing in a real demigoose as a Christmas treat, though Remus had no idea where he was going to get one. The teacher had taken them all down to the lake for one lesson, where Ferox held a long, high-pitched conversation with one of the Mer people who lived there. No one had the foggiest clue what they were talking about, but it had been interesting nonetheless, and Remus had made some very useful diagrams. It was armed with these diagrams and the accompanying essay that Remus approached Ferox's office one gloomy afternoon in December. Since both Sirius and James were now on the Quidditch team, it was much easier for Remus to sneak away and conduct his own personal business, lately either werewolf hunting or as Hogwarts' premier tobacco supplier. Lily had asked if he wanted to go to the library with her. He thought she must be feeling a bit lonely this term, as she was often asking if he wanted to go here or there with her. She's he hadn't noticed lonely. that she was spending any less time with Mary and Marlene, but who knew with girls? Anyway, having extricated himself from all other responsibilities, Remus knocked purposefully on the door of Ferox's office. Come in, the familiar Liverpudlian sing-song voice called out. Remus smiled and stepped inside. Hi, Professor, he said, clutching his papers. Loop in! Sit down, sit down! Ferox beamed up at him from behind his desk. He appeared to be making repairs to a very large golden cage his desktop covered with tools and wire and other oddments which didn't seem to belong in a teacher's office. I've got my merfolk essay here. He put it down on the only free bit of surface open. Blimey, Remus, you're keen, Professor Ferox smiled, tidying away his tools into a leather pouch. That wasn't due until the last day of term. Remus shrugged, secretly thrilled. I had it finished, so I thought I might as well hand it in now. Very good. Fancy a tea? Yes, please. Ferox pushed the large cage to one side and waved his wand casually. Ferox's wand was shorter than Remus's and thicker, made of some knobbly type of wood, as if snapped directly from a tree branch. A teapot appeared from nowhere, closely followed two cups and saucers which clattered noisily onto the table. They were quite old and chipped in places. Whoops! Ferox grinned bashfully. Never had much finesse with charms. That's me old nan set too. Remus smiled politely and used his own wand to pour the tea. He found levitation very easy, and Farox looked impressed. Nan used to drink it from the saucer and everything, he murmured nostalgically, lifting the cup to his lips. Thought it was elegant. Bless her. Remus never knew what to say when people started talking about their relatives. It had taken him four years to learn that people who had families did not really want to hear about the experiences of people without them. It made them uncomfortable. Ferox seemed to notice Remus's polite reticence and changed tact. At this point, my nan would offer a biscuit and a cigarette, but I'm afraid I've run out of both. Remus raised an eyebrow and fished inside his pocket. Here, sir, he said, offering a box of Marlboros. 
Ah, so the rumours are true. Our resident bootlegger. Remus shrugged again, carefully trying to mask his excitement as Farox actually accepted a cigarette and lit it neatly with his wand point. How'd you do that? he asked, trying it with his own wand, to no avail. Farox chuckled. Come here, and Remus leaned across the desk to allow Farox to light his cigarette. I better not teach you, the teacher winked. It's a terrible habit. Remus grinned through the cloud of smoke, taking a long drag. So, Ferox said, leaning back in his chair, I take it this is more than just a social visit, young Lupin. Um, yes, yeah, sort of, Remus nodded, clearing his throat. I just had a few more questions about, well, I don't know who to ask, and you said last year I could always come to you. Of course. Is it about your father? Oh, no. Remus shook his head vehemently. Not him. He may have sounded a bit more forceful than he meant to, but he was sick of Lyle Lupin and the awful, hollow, guilty feeling he got when he thought about the man. He didn't want to know any more about the past. This was about the future. Remus took another puff, letting it steady his nerves. It's about Greyback. Remus, I deserve to know, he said, darkly, losing his smile. It's my life. Ferox looked at him for a long time before sighing. Just like your dad. Oh, okay. What do you want to know? Not that there's much I can tell you, mind. For as anyone knows, he's still a wanted fugitive. The articles you gave me. One of them said that the Ministry thought he was trying to raise an army. That's why he likes... children. That's just a rumour, Ferox said, brows knit together. There's no evidence. I'm evidence, Remus said, unconsciously pressing a hand to his side, where the worst scar of all was hidden underneath his uniform. It still doesn't mean... Well, if he'd been trying to do that in the 60s, then you think we know about it by now, eh? That was a spurious line of reasoning, in Remus's opinion. He waved a hand. There've been attacks. If you've read the papers properly, the Dark Lord... He's the perfect person to encourage Greyback, from what I've heard. Something needs to be done to stop people joining them. To stop people like me from joining him. I don't know what you know about the so-called Dark Lord, Ferox replied stiffly, but he's only interested in blood purity. He would consider someone like Greyback a half-breed, beneath him. Remus thought of Snape and the other Slytherins, and immediately dismissed this theory too. He might not respect him, but as long as Greyback gets the job done, and if he gets enough followers... You're overestimating his power. Both of them. The Dark Lord is just a political upstart, feeding off some perceived oppression. No one takes him seriously. No one who matters. And Greyback? Well, he's practically a derelict. A raving lunatic. Neither of them have anything substantial to offer their followers. Remus snorted. Yeah... Well, the Ministry doesn't exactly have much to offer me, except for a collar and a barred cell. Remus, that's not true! Ferox sounded distressed. Remus didn't care. Yes, it is. I'm nearly fifteen. I'm not a little boy. My job prospects are only slightly less shit as a muggle than they are as a wizard. Can't help but notice I'm not supposed to tell anyone. Oh, wait, until I'm seventeen, then I'll have to tell everyone, right? Then everyone else gets to avoid me in case I get a bit peckish. Greyback might not have much else to offer us half-breeds, but then you haven't got a lot else going for you. Remus, you've got... No, I've read the laws and the statutes and the bullshit fucking registry. He stubbed out his cigarette in the dregs of his teacup furiously. The full moon was weeks away, but his temperature was rising. His heart was pounding as he glared at Ferox, challenging him to answer. Ferox himself looked quite shaken, struck dumb. This in and of itself cooled Remus's temper. He'd meant to have a rational discussion. He had wanted to learn things, not yell at his favourite teacher. He pulled out another cigarette and lit it with the matchbook he carried, then pushed the box across the desk to Ferox. Keep it he said, quietly inhaling. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to shout. It's okay to shout, Remus, 
Ferox smiled weakly. Especially when someone isn't listening, and you need to be heard. Remus looked at him quizzically. Ferox relaxed a bit. I think you see anger as a weakness, but it isn't. It's good to be angry, and you've got bloody good reason to be. You're right. We all need to worry about Voldemort, and Greyback, and the rest of the pure blood crowd. If the Ministry is prepared to treat good, clever, thoughtful wizards the way they treat you, then people like the Dark Lord will always have followers. Rima stared at him, stunned. But, Ferox said, there will always be people working against them too, and as long as we stay angry, they won't win. They won't win. Remus repeated. He usually felt embarrassed after an outburst like that, but now he actually felt calmer, relieved even. And don't you think for a minute that you have shit prospects? Ferox raised an eyebrow. If you think Dumbledore moved heaven and earth to get you an education just to see you end up no better than a squib, then you don't know Dumbledore, my boy. Friday, 20th of December, 1974. As December drew on and the night grew longer, the castle became engulfed in fairy lights and a heavy blanket of snow. Everyone seemed in higher spirits than usual and more excited to celebrate Christmas than ever before. Owls swooped through the halls at lightning speed, delivering packages and brightly enveloped cards. The Obology teacher had enchanted Holly and Ivy to weave itself round every chandelier and banister, Professor Flitwick could be seen most evenings teaching the portraits to sing carols, and Sirius Black ended the term dressed head to toe in tinsel. This hadn't actually been Sirius's idea. James had started it, using an everlasting sticking charm to affix the decorations to the collars and cuffs of Sirius's robes while he was asleep. If he thought this might embarrass Sirius, he was sorely mistaken. Black adorned his new look and wore it with pride. In fact, by the last day of term, at least 15 other boys had copied him, as well as a group of girls who'd lately taken to following Sirius round. It seemed that every girl in the school had found out about the great snogging race, and the effect was not what Remus had hoped for. While Marlene had acted sensibly in rejecting Black's advances, there were plenty of girls in their year, and even in the year above, who were hoping to help Sirius win the bet. He thought this great fun at first, but after almost a month of being followed by a pack of giggling teenagers, receiving heavily scented love notes and being interrupted at almost every turn, he'd enlisted Mary as a bodyguard. Mary was perfect for this. Bolshy, ready to speak her mind and not interested in Sirius at all. You're such a wuss, she sighed on the last evening of term as they all sat around the fireplace together. James was playing with a golden snitch he'd nicked from the game shed, trying to impress Lily, who had her head down and was frantically finishing her Christmas cards. Peter was nowhere to be found, Marlene was playing a game of chess with Remus, and Sirius had just called Mary to sit closer to him, cautiously eyeing up a group of girls watching him from the corner. "'I'm not a wuss,' he replied dryly, loosening his tie. "'I just like my privacy.' "'You can always just snog one of them.' Mary shot back, stretching out on the couch and draping her legs over Sirius's lap. She let her. Wasn't that the whole point of this bet? Well, yeah, Sirius replied in a measured tone. But they weren't supposed to know about it. I was supposed to win them over with my charm and roguish good looks. You're not scared, are you? Mary purred. I'd be mad not to be scared of girls, Sirius laughed. You're all mental. Mary, what's Darren's surname? Lily asked, looking up from a stack of cards. Harvey, Mary said. God, you're not sending him a card, are you? You've only met him once. It's nice to get cards at Christmas, Lily smiled, returning to her writing. All right, but don't send it by Owl. He's a muggle. How have you been writing to him all year? Remus asked, genuinely interested. I send the letters to Mum, and she pops them through his letterbox. He only lives across the hall, and there's a phone box just outside Hogsmeade, so we've chatted once or twice. I didn't know there was a phone box. Yeah, it's a bit ancient. One of the Ravenclaws told me it was a port key once during the war, but it still works. She stretched again. I can't wait to see him, she sighed. 
Sirius pushed her legs away, pretending to lean over and watch the chess game. "'Where are you going for Christmas, Remus?' Lily asked, licking her final envelope. "'Not staying here, I hope.' "'Lupin and Black are at mine again,' James said eagerly. Lily gave him a withering look. "'Oh, of course.' Remus was really looking forward to the Potters this year. He'd only be staying a week, as the full moon fell on the 29th, but that was fine with him. He just couldn't wait for the presents and the decorations and Mrs. Potter's cooking. I'm starving, Sirius yawned lazily. Where's Pete? Can we send him to the kitchens for us? No idea where he is, actually, James said. Haven't seen him since dinner. Is he packing? Lily suggested. I'll go and check. Remus stood up, stretching. I'm hungry, too. I think there are some cauldron cakes in my trunk. You don't say. Sirius got up, too, following him. Remus sighed. Sirius spent half his time begging for sweets off the rest of them. Not that he wasn't generous with his own. He just very rarely seemed to have any. Peter was not in the dorm room, but the cauldron cakes were. Wonder what's happened to him? Remus rubbed the back of his head. Check the map, Sirius said, spraying crumbs everywhere, mouthful of cake. Remus raised an eyebrow but said nothing and retrieved the map from his bedside table. He cast the locator spell and the map quickly highlighted a small flag with the name Peter Pettigrew. It looked as though he was in a broom cupboard near the charms classroom. What are we doing here? Sirius mumbled, stuffing another cake in his mouth. Remus tutted this time, folding up the map. I don't know. Can I reckon the Slytherins got him? <clears throat> Maybe, Sirius swallowed. If they put a binding spell on him, he might be stuck in there all night. Let's go and get him then. Shall I get James? Uh... Sirius glanced at the door, and Remus knew at once that he was dreading having to pass the gauntlet of girls waiting down there. Now let's take the cloak and sneak down. It won't take long, and only two of us fit anyway. Remus shrugged by way of consent. If it didn't take too long to rescue Peter, then maybe they could go to the kitchens afterwards. Sirius had finished his cauldron cakes. They huddled under the cloak together and hurried quietly downstairs, past James and the girls, out through the portrait hole. Bloody typical of Peter, Sirius huffed under his breath. Four years of marauder and still crap at defensive spells. Maybe they attacked him from behind, Remus suggested. Or maybe there were a lot of them. He didn't know why, but he loved contradicting Sirius. James called it bickering, but Sirius had never given any sign that it bothered him. On they went, through the shadowy stone hallways, toward the charms corridor. Here, is it this one? Sirius whispered as they reached a door. Yeah, Remus replied. He's in here. He could smell him. Okay. One ready. One, two, three. Sirius yanked open the door quickly, much to the surprise of Peter, who is very much not in danger, and Desdemona Lewis, who shrieked, Who's there? She stared round, pale and wide-eyed, her hair mussed up and her lips very pink and wet. Pete stared about as well, slightly more suspiciously, but just as rumpled. Probably just Peeves. Sirius began to shudder with laughter, and Remus quickly clamped a hand over his mouth, trying to pull him away from the cupboard. Poor Peter. I'm going back to my common room. I'll get in so much trouble if I'm caught out of bounds again. Desdemona was saying, straightening her blouse. She kissed Peter daintily on the nose. See you tomorrow, Petey. On the train. Yeah, okay. Peter replied, very distracted, still staring about, looking for their invisible assailant. Remus thanked whatever god there was for his superior strength, as Sirius fought madly to get free and cause even more mischief. Remus did not let him go until Desdemona had disappeared round the corner. Peter was wise to the situation by then. All right, shoot yourselves! He pulled out his wand just as Remus released Sirius and they both burst out from under the invisibility cloak. I knew it! Peter yelled. You sneak! Sirius crowed, laughing so hard he was holding his stomach. How long had that been going on? 
A week, Peter replied, turning red. I mean, How did you find me? A week? Merlin Pettigrew, what do you think you're on about lying to us for a whole week? You would have teased me. We tease you anyway. Can we please go to the kitchens now? Remus sighed. Wait till James hears about this, Sirius said, sounding awestruck. I can't believe it. I really can't. Peter Pettigrew, ladies' man. Oh, shut up, Peter sulked, shoving his hands in his pockets. I'm going up to the common room. I'm not hungry. Well, the way you were eating Lewis's face off... Shut up! Peter disappeared round the next corridor. Sirius laughed all the way to the kitchens and was still slightly hysterical on the way back, even laden with treats and goodies from the house elves. At least this means the stupid snogging race is over, Remus said pleasantly as they approached the portrait of the fat lady. Sirius stopped dead in his tracks, causing Remus to bump into him, nearly dropping his bottle of butterbeer. Ugh, I didn't think about that. Well, you don't have to think about it now, Remus snapped rubbing his elbow where he banged it. Pete won. You're right, Mooney! Urgh! That means if I don't get a snog by the end of this year, then I'm more of a loser than Pettigrew! Remus sighed heavily. Chapter 64 Fourth Year Christmas Monday, 23rd of December, 1974 Though Hogwarts had been as picturesque as a Christmas card under its blanket of highland snow, the marauders stepped off the train in London to grey southern drizzle. The weather continued in much the same way for most of Christmas break, meaning that sledding was off the cards this year, much to Remus's disappointment. It meant that the first few days before Christmas were pretty boring, and they made up for it by making regular trips into the village, underneath Mr Potter's huge black umbrella, and spent long afternoons in the Muggle cinema there. Remus had convinced them to go. He hadn't been to see a film since he started at Hogwarts, and Steve's gang had been talking about Death Wish all summer, so he was dying to see it. It was just as exciting as he'd hoped, full of revenge and gore, and Charles Bronson reminded him a bit of Professor Ferox. James and Sirius were more interested in figuring out how the projector worked, which suited Remus fine because it meant they agreed to go with him twice. However, Boredom soon got the best of them, and on the third visit to the picture house, a distraction presented itself in the form of a group of girls queuing at the ticket booth. At once, James and Sirius stopped discussing the ins and outs of visual perception versus frame rate, and started acting very oddly indeed. James made more of an effort to flatten his hair than ever, while Sirius began leaning casually against the wall as if he were James Dean. The girls obviously noticed, and kept glancing back and then giggling amongst themselves. They must be freezing wearing miniskirts in December, Remus thought to himself. Finally, the girls finished buying their tickets and went into the second screen. Booney, Sirius said, not taking his eyes off the gaggle of long legs that had just passed. How about we see something different today? Yeah, James said, blankly. Remus looked at the poster above the door. The Great Gatsby. He gr screwed up his face. Er, it's a romance! What do you want to see that for? He protested, but it was too late. They were already halfway in. Remus settled down in the front row and resigned himself to his fate. It might not be that bad. He liked Robert Redford and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. He wasn't as cool as Charles Bronson, but he might shoot someone at the very least. Half an hour later, and as much as he didn't want to admit it, Remus was thoroughly immersed in the film for all its pastel shades and silly costumes. There had been no shooting so far, but he was hoping for the best, and in the meantime, he was rooting for Daisy to see sense and leave her awful husband. At some point, Remus glanced to his left to see if Sirius and James were enjoying the film too, and found that he'd been abandoned. Twisting about in his seat, he stared into the darkness behind him, and could just make out the dark shapes of his two friends sitting in the very back row, both engaged in some kind of horrendous grappling match with two of the girls from earlier. Mortified, Remus turned round at once, slouching down in the red velvet seat. He couldn't concentrate on the film now, and he'd been right anyway. It was a stupid, boring, girly romance, and Robert Redford clearly wasn't going to shoot anyone any time soon. 
In a split second, he made his decision and quickly left the theatre. It was too late to get a ticket for Death Wish, and the usher behind the ticket stand was giving him a very pointed look, so he shoved his hands deep in his pockets and sloped out, feeling bitter and mean. The town James's parents lived in was a lot posher than the one Remus had grown up in. It was all pretty brick cottages and oak trees. There was a big village green at the centre, and Remus could imagine cricket taking place there in the summer. It was raining now, though, and James had the umbrella, so Remus had no choice but to duck for cover under the nearest bus shelter. There was a little shop right next to the bus stop, and he watched it for a while, checking out the simplest entry points. Not that he could break in. He definitely could. It looked really easy. But what if Mr. and Mrs. Potter found out? They'd never have him for Christmas again. He thought about going back to the house, but he didn't want to explain why he'd left Sirius and James in the picture house like that pricks. He kicked the side of the shelter with his heavy boots. An old woman, walking past with a little Scotty dog, tutted at him loudly, and he swore in return, throwing up a middle finger. Even James had let him down now. James, whose pure and honest adoration for Lily Evans had been the one thing that convinced Remus that snogging might not be that disgusting after all. He'd expected something like this from Sirius, who never had any kind of impulse control anyway. But James? Oh, hey, Mooney! As if by magic, James and Sirius appeared on the other side of the road underneath the big black umbrella. He tried to ignore them, but it was a bit stupid, seeing as they were the only three people on the street. Where are you off to? Sirius grinned as they crossed to join him under the bus shelter. Just sitting here, Remus shrugged. Why'd you leave? Could ask you the same. We only popped out for a minute. Oh, I don't want to hear about it. Remus covered his ears. He glared at James. What about Lily? What about, it's not time yet, but I don't mind. Remus parroted back the words James had spoken in November. James looked stricken for a moment, but Sirius laughed heartily and slapped Remus on the shoulder. Oh, come off it. Evans isn't going to care if Potter snogged some muggle girl when he was fourteen. Calm down, Mooney. That did it. If there was anything more like to send Remus into a rage, it was being told to calm down. No, he growled. You made me watch a stupid girl's film just so you could grope a couple of muggle birds in the back row. Sirius tossed his dark hair and rolled his eyes. Merlin Lupin. We can go and see your beloved Charles Bronson tomorrow if you really want. I mean, excuse us if we want to act like normal teenagers for five minutes. Something about this insult struck Remus so sharply that if he'd had his wand, he'd have cursed Sirius right then and there. As it was, he only had his fists. Fortunately, he was pretty good with those, and punching was often a lot more satisfying than cursing. By the time James had wrenched them apart and stood between them, Sirius's nose was extremely bloody, and Remus could feel the beginnings of a black eye forming. "'What's wrong with you two? James huffed, dragging the both of them through the rain back to his parents' house. "'He's a tosser!' Remus spat, trying to keep the drizzle out of his sore eye. "'He's a wanker!' Sirius returned, stuffily, holding his wet jumper up against his nose. "'You're both dickheads!' James said firmly, as they reached the front gate. Mrs. Potter fixed them both up quickly. She was just as quick at healing spells as Madame Pomfrey, then gave them a good telling off, with Mr. Potter standing behind her, trying not to smile and saying, Boys will be boys, Effie, dear. Afterwards, Remus went straight up to the spare room and sat on the bed for the rest of the day doing his holiday homework. He knew it was silly and childish to sulk, but if he had to see Sirius again, he couldn't be sure he wouldn't swing for him. He thought about Ferox telling him, it's good to be angry, but somehow didn't think that was what the teacher meant. Was he jealous? Jealous that all his friends had copped off with a girl now and he hadn't. Maybe that was it. Remus couldn't really ignore the fact that he was the only one of his friends who wasn't completely driven by his hormones, like a normal teenager, as Sirius had so kindly put it. Ouch. There was that pain again. Remus drew his knees up under his chin, making himself as small as possible. If he had a galleon for every way in which he wasn't normal. 
He went down for dinner but didn't talk to James or Sirius, limiting himself only to polite interchanges with Mr. and Mrs. Potter. After they were excused from the table, he went straight back upstairs and curled up under the duvet with a book until he fell asleep. He dreamed that he was back in the cinema, trying to watch a strange combination between The Great Gatsby and Death Wish, in which Professor Ferox really was Charles Bronson, black moustache and all, aiming his pistol at the gleaming socialites of West Egg. Something kept nudging Remus's elbow, distracting him from the film. He turned and saw that it was Peter and Desdemona, writhing about in the seat beside him, lips locked. Annoyed, Remus got up and sat in the row behind, returning to the film. Soon after, something else bothered him. It was Mary and Darren. Remus had of course never met Darren, and the boy in the dream looked just like Mulciba, for some reason. They were snogging too. Disgusted, Remus tried to get up once more, but tripped over Lily and James, who were rolling in the aisle. For God's sake, he shouted. Lily looked up at him and laughed. So did Mary, and now Peter and James too. Sirius appeared at the very back of the theatre, his body silhouetted by the whirring projector. Never mind him, he laughed along with the others. He's not like us. Remus spun around just in time to see Farrock shoot Robert Redford, then woke up with a start. He was hot and sweating under the heavy duvet and had to fight to free himself. Feeling very silly for having had a nightmare at his age, he clambered out of the large four-poster bed and headed for the nearest bathroom. The clock on the landing read midnight, so he didn't turn any lights on, though he could see a faint yellowish glow seeping out from James's bedroom door. Remus used the loo, then washing his hands and face, taking a few sips from the cold tap before wiping himself dry on his pyjama sleeves. Feeling much better, he returned to his bedroom, just as James's door swung open. "'Bloody hell, it's you, Mooney,' James whispered, sounding relieved. "'What are you doing creeping round in the dark?' Remus shrugged and whispered back. I can see in the dark. Didn't want to wake anyone up. James nodded and opened his door a bit wider. Thought you might be Gully, spying on us for Mum or something. Come in, yeah? Let's all be mates again. It didn't take much convincing for Remus to agree. Fighting took up too much energy, especially when you all live together. He still didn't really want to talk to Sirius, but he went in for James's sake. Sirius was sitting cross-legged on James's bed and frowned when he saw Remus. James sighed. Come on, we're all friends, right? It's Christmas! Sirius nodded solemnly. Remus nodded back. He joined them on the bed where he was surprised to see they were poring over some spell books. Homework? he asked. Prank, James replied. Haven't worked out the kinks yet, though. Oh, okay, Remus nodded. And then, because he didn't want to be awkward any more, he asked, How's your nose, Black? Fine, Sirius grinned at him, relaxing into humour at once. You're losing your touch. Remus smirked. Oh yeah? Ask Snape. Headbutted him on the train in September. You never did. Yup. Bloody hell, James laughed. And he hasn't tried it on since? Not yet, Remus said, trying not to sound too nervous about it. Probably planning something, though. What's the prank? Well, um, tell you when we know how to do it. Might not come off right. James said quickly, closing the book nearest him. Remus raised an eyebrow and said nothing. This only confirmed a suspicion he'd had for quite some time. He didn't want to get into any of that now, though. He'd wait and see if anything came of it. Sorry I brought up Lily, he said to James. I didn't mean it. Sirius is right. She won't care. If she's ever stupid enough to go out with you, that is. James shoved him playfully. Piss off. At least that stupid conversation is over now, yeah? Remus asked, hopefully, looking at Sirius. Yeah, I suppose, Sirius shrugged. We paid Peter's dues, anyway. Want a letdown, though. Snogging, I mean. Don't know what all the fuss is about. Remus didn't say anything, though he was secretly pleased. He wasn't missing out on anything after all. It was all right, James said diplomatically. Probably takes practice. Must get better. It had get better, Sirius said very seriously. James and Remus burst out laughing. Christmas Day, 1974 
Christmas morning was as dark and gloomy as the previous week had been, and Remus was woken by the noise of rain pelting against his bedroom window. Still, the Potter's house was as festive as ever, and the five of them settled down to a hearty breakfast with smiles on their faces. Breakfast was quickly followed by presents, the usual fare of sweets, chocolate, new quills from the Potter's, books and socks. Remus was very surprised to receive a hand-knitted scarf from Lily in Gryffindor red with gold tassels. He felt a bit bad. He hadn't bought anything for any of the marauders this year, let alone the girls. She'd never given him a gift before, except for the reading aid, which, he had to admit, had been a pretty good present. He resolved to get something for her next time they went to Hogsmeade. They were just finishing up with presents, Mrs. Potter vanishing the scrunched-up wrapping paper with a sweep of her wand, when a loud, mournful song sounded in the hallway. It was a high-pitched, haunting melody, completely unnatural and completely beautiful. They all turned at once, Mr. and Mrs. Potter withdrawing their wands in a dueling stance, and a strange ethereal silver bird flew into the room, circling their heads. Remus recognised it at once as a phoenix, or something like the ghost of one. Dumbledore, Mr. Potter said quietly, as the silver phoenix settled magisterially on the mantelpiece. Much to Remus's surprise, the bird opened its beak and spoke in their headmaster's voice. There has been an attack. I will be with you shortly. Do not allow anyone else entry. And with that, the phoenix vanished into thin air. They were all quiet for a while before Mrs. Potter spoke, placing a hand on James's shoulder as if she just needed to touch her son. Oh, Monty, an attack! No need to panic, Mr. Potter said calmly. Albus will be here soon. Boys, finish cleaning up, eh? I'll be in my study. They tidied up in silence, all waiting to see what would happen next. An attack? What would that mean? Remus's mind went straight to Greyback, but it wasn't a full moon, so unlikely to have been werewolves. Could it be Voldemort? Were there other dark wizards out there? Guiltily, he looked over at Sirius, who was staring out of the window at the rain, looking pale and shocked. His family were dark wizards. Did he know anything about it? Surely not. Remus quickly dismissed the idea, feeling even worse. Sirius hadn't been home since summer, and it was common knowledge that his family hated him. Finally, after what seemed like a decade, but can only have been twenty minutes, there was a crack of apparition outside, and Mr. Potter was at the front door. Mrs. Potter joined him, and James, Sirius, and Remus hung back in the hallway, watching. The door opened, and Dumbledore stood there, looking very grave, completely dry despite the rain beating down in sheets. Fremont? Euphemia? He nodded politely. Mr. Potter held up his wand. What was the last thing we spoke about? Your son having broken his record for a number of detentions this term. Dumbledore smiled, glancing at James, who turned red. This apparently satisfied Mr. Potter, who stepped back to allow Dumbledore entry. Come in, Dumbledore. Would you like some tea? Mrs. Potter asked, taking his travelling cloak and ushering him into the living room. Upstairs, boys. Mr. Potter said sternly. James looked about to argue, but Dumbledore stepped in for him. If you wouldn't mind, Fleamont, I think it is best that the boys hear this. It'll be all over the papers tomorrow anyway. Mr. Potter looked at his wife, then nodded. The small party sat down in the large living room, waiting for Gully to come in with the tea. It was a very odd scene. Christmas cards still glittering on the walls, tinsel sparkling along the picture rails, Open presents piled up under the tree, and Dumbledore, still looking uncharacteristically serious in midnight blue velvet robes. Sirius James and Remus sat squashed up on the sofa, while Mr. Potter remained standing, pacing the room. An attack, then? he said, f finally, impatient. I'm afraid so. The Fraser family, in Newcastle. Fraser? Never heard of them. No, Mr. and Mrs. Fraser were both muggle-born, they had two children, not yet old enough for Hogwarts, but as far as we know, showing signs of magical ability. Remus winced at the past tense. Mr. Potter had clearly noticed this too, for he looked very pale and tired all of a sudden. All four of them? Yes. Mrs. Potter looked like she was about to cry. Children! she gasped. Children! And do we know for sure? Mr. Potter continued anxiously. We know it was him. Voldemort, yes. 
He left a mark. A mark? It'll be in the papers tomorrow, I imagine. The Daily Prophet was there before I was alerted. What does it mean? Who were the Frasers? Mr. Fraser worked for St. Mungo's, Dumbledore explained. He recently raised a petition with the Ministry suggesting that healers receive training in muggle healing techniques. First aid, I believe he called it. This didn't go down very well with certain factions, I'm sure you can imagine. I think I remember Darius saying something. Mr. Potter nodded, leaning a hand on the mantelpiece thoughtfully. But to kill! It hasn't been the first time, Dumbledore said darkly. But it is the first time they have made themselves known. This mark that was left behind. It has been seen elsewhere. Some of the old families have adopted it. A kind of secret sign of their allegiance to Voldemort. Only not so secret any more. Which families? Sirius said suddenly, looking at Dumbledore. He was tense all over. Remus could feel it. Dumbledore looked at him kindly. There is nothing so far to link the blacks to this attack. So far, Sirius repeated. But you know they... there. It doesn't help anyone to jump to conclusions. Dumbledore held up a hand. The situation is grave, yes, but we must not lose our heads or allow emotion to cloud our judgment. There are difficult times ahead, and we will all need each other to be vigilant. He said this directly to Sirius and seemed to be speaking to James and Remus too. Remus felt an uncomfortable twisting in his abdomen. He did not understand everything, but he knew that some great responsibility had settled on their shoulders, one he wasn't sure he could live up to. "'I'm not trying to frighten anyone,' Dumbledore continued, as if he'd read Remus's mind. "'But nor do I wish to devalue the seriousness of today's events. I am working quickly to gather support, a line of defence against Voldemort. I have already spoken to a number of trustworthy associates within the Ministry. Fleamont, can I count on you?' "'Of course,' Mr. Potter said at once. "'Have you spoken to the Weasleys, the Pruitts, the Boneses?' Dumbledore nodded, smiling. "'All on my list, of course.' "'We can help,' James spoke up. Mrs. Potter sucked in her breath, her eyes still very pink. "'Yeah,' Sirius said, eager to show himself equal to James. "'You gonna bend on us, sir?' Remus didn't say anything, but he nodded along, hoping that Dumbledore knew that he too had chosen his side. "'I hope it will not come to that.' Dumbledore was smiling, his forget-me-not blue eyes twinkling with emotion for his pupils. "'Thank you, boys.' "'No!' Mrs. Potter said. "'They're children, Dumbledore!' "'I'm of age in two years,' Sirius said, straightening up, asserting his position as the eldest marauder. "'And we're the best in year at defensive spells.' "'And hexes,' James put in, then quickly shut up, seeing the look his mother shot him. Dumbledore chuckled softly. "'Indeed,' he said. "'Your mother is quite right, however. "'All I ask is that you are on your guard "'and that you look after each other. "'Now I must be going. "'I have other calls to make. "'Fleamont!' "'Dumbledore stood up and shook Mr. Potter's hand. "'I will be in touch. "'Euphemia!' "'He turned to Mrs. Potter apologetically. "'Merry Christmas. "'I'm afraid I won't be attending your party tonight. "'We may as well cancel it.' Mrs. Potter rubbed her arms as if the room had turned cold. It seems disrespectful. Enjoy your holidays, boys. Remus, Madame Pomfrey will meet you at the Three Broomsticks flu stop on Sunday morning. Remus nodded obediently, and with that, Dumbledore vanished with a loud crack. Chapter 65 Fourth Year January Wednesday, 8th of January, 1975. Dumbledore was quite right. The Fraser family's murder was front-page news on Boxing Day, followed by a series of features and articles on the mounting war which dominated the rest of Christmas break. It was the first time Remus, or any of them, ever saw the dark mark, and they had no idea that it was a symbol they would fear for the rest of their lives. A great black skull with a great gaping mouth and a long, ropey serpent writhing forth. It was distinctly Slytherin-esque, and as soon as they were back at Hogwarts, Sirius blasted the remaining snake motifs off his trunk. "'Careful, mate,' James said as smoke from Sirius's spell filled the room. "'You might be ruining a family heirloom there.' "'I don't give a shit,' 
Sirius replied, firing his wand at the blackened wood once more for good measure. It's mine, and I don't want anything of mine to have that ruddy mark on it. It was pointless trying to reason with him. Since Dumbledore's visit to the Potters, Sirius's hatred for anything remotely Slytherin had increased tenfold. He'd been using hexes to defend younger students from Slytherins all year, but now he seemed to be actively seeking out trouble. The war isn't happening here, Remus tried telling him once, after his third detention in as many days. Dumbledore told us to be vigilant, not start fights. The war is everywhere, Sirius replied, and James nodded in agreement. Anyway, you can talk. What about you and Snape? That, Remus replied piously, was personal. It was true. He didn't hate Snape because he was a dark wizard or a Slytherin or anything like that. Remus didn't like Snape because he was a nosy busybody. That and nobody really liked Snape, except Lily. Actually, Remus thought to himself, as he looked across the common room at Lily, sitting by Marlene working on some sort of transfiguration spell on a pair of shoes, even Lily hadn't been hanging around Severus very much these days. Perhaps they'd fallen out. The redhead looked up and met his eyes, smiling brightly. He smiled back. James, sitting next to him, waved, and Lily rolled her eyes and returned to the spell she was working on. Doesn't she know how much I've matured? James sighed heavily, thumbing through the pages of his textbook. I don't know if snogging a muggle in the back of the cinema really counts as maturing, Remus replied, rescuing the manhandled book and smoothing down the corners James had bent. I didn't mean that, James grinned. Just like, in general, I don't get it. I get on with Marlene, okay? You're on the Quidditch team with Marlene, Peter said. You've got stuff in common with her. Peter had become very wise since getting a girlfriend. So what? James said slowly. You think I should try and get Lily on the Quidditch team? Peter tutted pitifully. Why don't you find out something you both have in common? Like how me and Desdemona both like chess and cheese sandwiches and... We've got nothing in common, James replied dreamily. That's why I like her. Never going to happen then, Peter sniffed with an air of finality. James looked crestfallen. Don't listen to him, Remus said, taking pity. People don't just go out with people because they're the same. That would be boring. Opposites attract and all that. Yeah, you're right, Mooney, James cheered up. Maybe I should find out what sort of stuff she likes, though. Uh, yeah, might be a start. Remus shook his head, returning to his charms essay. He'd made his peace with the girl obsession now. It was just easier to nod along and pretend to be sympathetic. Fortunately, most of James and Sirius's attention was taken up with training for the upcoming Quidditch match against Slytherin, which was set up for early February. With the war looming over everyone, the competition between the two houses had taken on a new and important meaning, and Sirius and James treated their positions on the team as full-time occupations. As a consequence, Remus saw very little of them at the beginning of the spring term. He spent much of his time in the library as usual, and when the other two weren't on the pitch practising, with Peter watching, of course, they were in detention for one thing or another. There was hardly any time to work on the map, or even plan a new prank. The marauders passed each other like ships in the night. The situation grew so extreme that when the first Hogsmeade weekend rolled round halfway through January, Remus found himself without anyone to go with. He almost considered not going at all until Lily brought it up in potions one afternoon, suggesting that he go with her and he assumed, Mary and Marlene. It sounded like a nice enough way to spend his Saturday, and he remembered that he still owed Lily a present for Christmas. He agreed, met Lily in the common room on Saturday morning, and they started down toward the Hogwarts front entrance. "'What happened to the M's? Remus asked, surprised, when he found they were alone. Lily blushed, but that might have been cold air. "'I thought it could just be the two of us, this time.' "'Fair enough,' he smiled. He liked Lily's company very much, almost as much as the marauders. So what are they all in detention for? she asked, as they trudged through the snow down to the village. Various things, Remus waved his hand. Peter got caught out of bounds after dark, James got the blame for changing the words on the Slytherin trophies, and I think Sirius hexed a second year. Typical, Lily tutted. Yeah, Remus grinned as they trudged through the snow, following the trail of dark-robed students ahead of them. The trophy was brilliant, though, you have to admit. That charm lasted seven days. It wasn't a very nice thing to do, though, Lily frowned. Remus sighed. Why did girls always want to be nice? 
Once they reached the village, they stopped at the stationers because they both needed new quills. Remus bought one for Sirius and one for Peter, too, because they'd asked, telling Lily how Peter pressed too hard on his parchment and snapped two quills a week, leaving blotches everywhere, and how Sirius only used the most expensive brand because he was vain about his handwriting. After that, they went to the post office, where Remus sent the Potters a package on James's behalf. It was Mrs. Potter's birthday, he explained to Lily, and James hated missing any occasion to give a gift. Freezing cold by then, they decided that a butterbeer had be the next port of call, and opted for the three broomsticks. They found a small table by the fireplace and sat companionably, chatting about their lessons and their Christmases. Lily had had a big fight with her sister, which she talked about at great length. Remus told her about going to see Deathwish, but didn't mention Dumbledore's visit. "'Do you go to the Potters every year, then?' Lily asked. "'Yes,' Remus said fervently. "'They're amazing. Me and Sirius always go, and Pete's only up the road from James, so that's cool.' "'Are you four always together?' Lily looked amused. It rubbed Remus up the wrong way. "'They're my friends. My best mates.' "'I know that,' she replied, sounding a bit snippy herself. "'But you've been talking about them all afternoon.' "'Have not,' Remus grunted defensively, looking into his butterbeer, embarrassed. So what if I have? Well, I sort of wanted to get to know you better, not your friends. Lily had two red patches in her cheeks now, like a Dutch doll. Remus couldn't understand why she was so annoyed. You know me, though. You've known me for four years. Lily stared at him, disbelieving. Then her expression changed. She ran a hand through her hair and laughed humorlessly. Oh, Remus, she sighed. What? She shook her head. I'm such an idiot. You really have no idea why I wanted to spend the weekend with you, do you? He shrugged. She smiled, giving him that pitying look that girls were so good at. Never mind, she said. Don't worry about it. After that, the tone of the afternoon seemed to change. Lily appeared to relax into her usual self and started joking along with him. She even had a bit of a whinge about Snape, who said something extremely rude to Mary recently. Remus never got to the bottom of why she'd been so moody in the first place, but he decided that it might have just been him mentioning his friends. She'd always been clear about finding them annoying. She would only accept the price of a butterbeer from him by way of a present, and assured that he needn't feel like he owed her anything. It wasn't until the next day, when Remus, James, Sirius and Peter were all sitting at breakfast, that everything became clear. James and Sirius were in their Quidditch robes ready for practice, furtively discussing tactics, while Peter listened with deep interest, nodding and murmuring. Yeah, exactly, now and then. Remus was checking his book list. He had several to return, and a few more he still needed to cross-reference before he could complete his Transfiguration essay. Marlene sat down next to them in her own red robes and reached for the tea. So, she addressed Remus, how'd yesterday go? Hmm? he asked, looking up from his parchment. Yesterday? You and Lily in Ogsmeade. She was giving him a very knowing smile. She wouldn't tell us what happened, so it must be good. What are you talking about? Yeah, Sirius looked up curiously. What are you talking about, McKinnon? Didn't he tell you? She stirred sugar into her tea innocently. Remus and Lily were on a date yesterday. What? James, Sirius and Remus all exclaimed at the same time. Sirius began to laugh. Mooney on a date? With Evans? James looked horrified. Bloody hell, Peter said. It wasn't a date, Remus said, slamming down his quill. As he said the words, he felt a horrible sinking feeling. Had it been a date? How are you supposed to know if people ambushed you like that? He looked at James desperately. But I don't fancy Lily, she's just a friend. Yeah, I know, mate. James said, though Remus didn't think he sounded very sure. It's fine. I'll see you after practice. With that, James got up and left the table. Sirius stared after him for a moment, then looked at Remus, then back at James, before shrugging helplessly and getting up to follow his friend out of the hall. Peter followed shortly after, and Remus lay his head on the table, groaning. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Remus, Marlene said very quietly. I had no idea, um... James really fancies her, then. Remus groaned again before getting up and grabbing his books. I am off to the library, he said, not looking at her. He didn't go to the library, though, in case Marlene went to find him there, or even worse, told Lily and Mary where he was. 
For the first time since his second year, Remus went into hiding. The problem with this, of course, was how much he'd grown since his second year. Most of his usual nooks and crannies were simply too small now. In the end, he settled himself behind the statue of the Pumpback Witch, just inside the passageway to Honeydukes. It was dark, but his wand was lit, and the faint smell of chocolate was very comforting. He tried to read, but his brain wouldn't let him concentrate. It seemed to just want to keep playing his visit to Hogsmeade over and over again. Had Lily said something he'd missed? Had it been in her body language, maybe, when she dropped hints? Would James have understood them? Would Sirius have? It was very unfair, Remus thought to himself pitily. Lily was a very good friend. Why would she want to muddle it all up with feelings and holding hands and kissing? He really hoped he wouldn't have to talk to her about it now. Maybe she was just as embarrassed as he was. Worst of all, what if James never spoke to him again? He didn't know how to explain that he didn't see Lily in that way, not when every other Gryffindor in their year seemed hell-bent on coupling up. Maybe he ought to have snogged Marlene when she'd offered back in November. He wondered if they'd all leave him alone since he'd got it over with. You've got to start snogging girls sometime, he told himself. Everybody does it. It's normal. But not Lily. He couldn't do that to James. In fact, Remus decided, that was probably the very reason he wasn't interested in her, because she was otherwise extremely pretty, funny, kind, clever, and better than him at charms. Lily was just the sort of girl he would fancy, Remus knew for sure. It was just that his friendship with James was much more important. Feeling very enlightened and self-sacrificing, Remus emerged from his hiding place. He set off down the nearest staircase, planning to go to the Quidditch pitch and catch the last few minutes of practice. After that, he would do something nice for James, offer to read over his history essay or something. Yes, then everything would be all right again. But as Remus had once been told, the best laid plans often go wrong. He was just nearing the bottom of the staircase, taking it three steps at a time just because he could and not really looking where he was going. He knocked headlong into another student coming up. Watch it, mudblood, Severus Snape snarled, scrambling to his feet, glaring at Remus. Remus tutted. Piss off, Snivellus, I'm much as half-blood as you are. You and I have nothing in common, I assure you, Snape replied haughtily, brushing off his robes. I suppose when it comes to hygiene standards... Careful, loony lupin. Snape narrowed his beady eyes. Don't say something you'll regret. No, oh, bugger off, Remus replied impatiently, stepping forward. I haven't got time for this. Either curse me now or get out of my way. Snape stepped to the side at once, giving a flourish with his hand to show Remus he was free to go. It was disquieting, but Remus couldn't worry about that now, and continued on his way. Chapter 66 Fourth Year February James Potter was a much more complex person than he appeared at first glance. Outwardly, he was happy, self-assured, usually kind, if a bit arrogant, and generally popular with everybody. He got a lot of detentions, yes, but on the whole he got good marks, and most of the teachers were still quite fond of him. He made the most of being on the Quidditch team, messing up his hair deliberately so that he looked like he'd just finished flying, wearing his red robes at every opportunity. But no one could say that he hadn't earned the right, you only had to see him play to know that his big-headedness was not misplaced. Above all, James Potter was loved. His parents spoiled him and instilled in him the notion that there was nothing he couldn't do, that no door would ever be closed to him. Peter, Sirius, and Remus all looked up to him, appointing him leader in almost every venture, and, all in all, he was admired throughout the school by everyone who mattered and envied by everyone else. Except for Lily Evans, of course. She was the thread that seemed to unravel everything else in James's life. Having grown up surrounded by love, freely given and carelessly accepted, James found it very troubling that someone he liked might not like him back. It was the reason he acted like an idiot whenever Lily was present, and the reason that he stopped talking to Remus for a week during the early spring of 1975. He wasn't being nasty or doing it deliberately. Remus knew James well enough to understand that. It was just that his feelings had been hurt, and as someone who'd rarely experienced hurt feelings, wasn't sure how to handle it. At least Sirius blew up at you when you annoyed him, so it could be quickly solved. Peter would sulk, and Remus would probably just try to throw a punch. But James just went quiet. 
He's not angry with you, Sirius explained when James went to bed one night as soon as Remus arrived in the common room. He just feels sorry for himself. He does believe me, though, doesn't he? Remus asked anxiously. I really didn't know it was a date. I don't like Lily in that way. Well, I don't think he thinks you're lying exactly, but you're pretty close to Evans, aren't you? Always going round together? She's my friend, Remus said, exasperated. I go round with Marlene and Mary, too. No one thinks I'm going out with them. Actually, Sirius smirked, there was a rumour last term. Oh, for God's sake! It was impossible. As for Lily, she was being reliably mature about the whole thing. Remus assumed Marlene had filled her in on the situation, but she didn't press it, and they were able to continue as potions partners as normal. James and Sirius, however, had moved their workstation to the back of the room. By Friday dinner time, Remus was truly miserable. Unlike James, he'd not grown up surrounded by love, and he found that his friendship with the Marauders had become so important that he suffered deeply from the loss of it. He still sat with them for meals, but there was an uneasy quiet instead of their usual raucous banter. Sirius kept trying to turn the conversation toward the upcoming Gryffindor vs Slytherin match, but that only seemed to darken the mood. Making matters worse, Lily, Marlene and Mary had sat themselves close to Remus. They were feeling sorry for him, and, being girls, were trying to cheer him up by doing exactly the wrong thing. "'I'm looking forward to the match,' Mary smiled cheerfully. "'Of all the Hufflepuffs and Ravenclaws I've spoken to, they're all supporting Gryffindor too.' Lily sighed heavily. "'Why does it always have to be so black and white? No one's good overall or bad overall, not even Slytherins.' "'You can't blame us, Lily,' Marlene replied. "'Even if it's not all of them, most of the Slytherins have been utterly foul this year.' "'Speak of the devil,' Mary lowered her voice suddenly, shooting a filthy look over Lily's shoulder. Lily and Remus turned round to see Severus Snape standing there, with an odd smile on his face that was anything but joyful. "'Hello, Lily,' he said softly. "'Hi, Sev,' Lily replied with a forced sort of politeness. What's up? I just thought I'd check to see if you wanted any extra help with the potions assignment. It's very complex. I know, she replied, irritated, but I'm sure I'll manage. Bang! Everyone at the table jumped and spun round to stare at the end of the hall, where Mulciba had just let off a firecracker at the end of the Slytherin table. He was laughing heartily as the whole school looked on, terrified. Five points from Slytherin! McGonagall shouted, marching up the aisle between the tables. And you'll clean this mess up at once! Dinner returned to normal. Snape was still standing there. Lily looked up at him. As I said, Remus and I'll manage, she said. I'm not stupid, you know, Sev. I never said you were. Snape looked genuinely upset by this. I just... Oh, never mind. With that, he cast an unpleasant glance at Remus, then swept away, back to his own table. Weirdo, Mary muttered. Leave him alone, Lily snapped. She looked so fierce that Mary didn't even have a comeback. Um, have any of you had any luck with that hinky punk essay? Marlene asked quickly, trying to keep the peace. Mine's crap. I'll lend you my notes if you want, Remus offered, taking a gulp of pumpkin juice. Once Sirius gives them back... Sirius looked up, hearing his name spoken. Oh, yeah, sorry, Mooney, hang on, they're in my bag. He began digging around the junkyard that was his book bag, pulling out scrunched up balls of parchment, dung bombs, sweets, and broken quills. How do you find anything in there? Remus sighed, sipping some more pumpkin juice. You're the messiest person I've ever met. Sirius shrugged and winked at him, withdrawing the notes and handing them to Marlene. Oh, Remus, Mary said, did I tell you I had another letter from Darren this week? Remus groaned. Yes, he whined, and it was just as boring as the last five hundred letters you've made me read. Sirius snorted. Marlene dropped her fork. Mary looked horrified and opened her closed her mouth a few times. Remus frowned. Why on earth had he said that? Of course it was true, but it was horribly thoughtless and mean. Sorry, he said, looking down. He felt strange. Maybe the James thing was getting to him even more than he thought. No, I'm sorry, Mary said, standing up, her lower lip trembling. I won't bother you any more, then. She turned quickly and left the room, her plate of food half-eaten. Mary, 
Marlene got up, running to follow her. Lily looked at Remus. Did you mean that? Yes, he said promptly. Actually, I find all this boyfriend-girlfriend stuff boring. I wish you'd all just leave me alone. Once he stopped talking, he blinked, surprised at himself. Why was he saying all these things? Remus, Lily said, looking shocked. Though made of sterner stuff than Mary, she didn't leave. There's nothing wrong with Mary wanting to talk about her boyfriend or uh, teenagers having crushes. It's normal, isn't it? I don't care if it's normal, he shrugged. I think you're all acting like idiots. Even you. Why on earth would you want to go out with me when the most popular boy in school is madly in love with you? He's ten times nicer than me, too. You're just too arrogant to see it. Remus, Lily said again, turning red. Well, it's true, he said helplessly. Mooney, Sirius said finally. Are you okay? I'm fine. Still a bit hungry, though. Think Mary will mind if I finish her potatoes? Seriously, Remus, James piped up unexpectedly. This isn't like you at all. I'm just being honest. Yeah, brutally o Oh, Merlin! Sirius slapped his forehead. D Evans, did Snape put something in his drink? When the fireworks went off, maybe? He would never do something like that. It's illegal. Pfft! Remus snorted, mouthful of mashed potatoes. As if Snivellus gives a toss, he's been trying to get back at me ever since I hit him on the train. You what? Lily stared at him. Yeah, Remus swallowed. Nodded him right in the head. It was great. He knew there was definitely something wrong now. He couldn't seem to help it. The truth just kept spilling out of him. Right, Sirius stood up. Stop talking, Mooney, before you say something you really regret. Those words dislodged a memory in Remus's mind. You know, he grinned, that's exactly what Snape said on the stairs the other day. Deborah's, Lily shouted at the top of her voice. She got up and stormed over to the Slytherin table, Sirius James, Remus and Peter in tow. What have you done to Remus? she demanded, stamping her foot angrily on the flagstone floor. Why do you ask? Snape smirked cruelly. You tell me how to fix him right now. There's nothing wrong with him, Severus replied calmly. Is there, Remus? Nothing, really, Remus shrugged. I do keep saying things I shouldn't, though, like, Shut up! Sirius kicked him hard in the shin, distracting Remus from spilling his guts to Snape. Sirius now rounded on the Slytherin boy. You bastard! It's Veritaserum, isn't it? Truth potion! Only one way to find out. Severus's smile broadened. What's your deepest, darkest secret, Lupin? Oh God, where to start? Remus thought to himself. He knew he shouldn't say anything, mustn't say anything. He would be in terrible danger if anyone found out. But he wanted to. He wanted to very badly. He'd so many secrets and they were all swimming to the surface of his mind, like life buoys. I'm a werewolf. I'm planning to hunt down and murder Fenrir Greyback. I spent the whole summer stealing and drinking and fighting. I can't read properly without help. I'm secretly running an illegal trade in muggle cigarettes. I don't fancy girls at all. Not any of them. I don't think I ever will. He opened his mouth. Well, I'm a... Silencio! Sirius shouted suddenly, aiming his wand at Remus while James tackled him to the floor, clamping a hand over his mouth. Everyone on the Slytherin table burst out laughing as James and Remus struggled together on the floor, Lily watching them completely nonplussed. Remus's mouth kept moving, desperate to divulge every one of his secrets until he was completely free of them, but not a sound escaped his lips. Sirius was excellent at silencing charms. Together, Peter, Sirius and James hoisted Remus to his feet and dragged him bodily from the dining hall, amid a furry of laughter and cheers from the Slytherins. Only once they were upstairs and shut inside their dorm room did Sirius lift the charm, allowing Remus to speak. By then, unfortunately, the urge to tell everyone everything had passed. Sorry, Remus, Sirius said, but I had to do it. You were going to... I know, Remus hung his head, sitting on his bed. Bloody Snape! How long does it take to wear off? Depends on how much you took, I think, James said, flicking through his new potions book. Godric, how did he do it? That's N-E-W-T-level stuff, truth serum. He's the best in the year at potions, Remus supplied unwillingly. Lily said he's already doing seventh-year essays for fun. What a boring old swat, 
Sirius snorted, joining James in searching through the book. Try not to say anything, okay, Mooney? I can't help it, Remus said without meaning to. Okay, right, it says here you should be clear within 24 hours, so dinner time tomorrow at the very least. What about lessons? We'll say you're sick. You can't risk it, Mooney. I could kill Snape, that filthy, dirty, underhanded. I'm not missing any lessons for him, Remus folded his arms. There must be an antidote. We could go and ask Slughorn, James said finally. That's a good idea. I think he's still in the Great Hall, Sirius nodded. He turned to Remus and spoke very clearly and slowly, as if he were talking to a child. Remus, stay here. Bugger off, Remus turned away, pouting like a little boy. I'll stay with him, James said. You two go. Sirius needed no more than that, and he was bounding down the stairs, calling back. Hang in there, Mooney. If I see a Slytherin on my way down, then I'll... But he didn't hear the rest. Sirius had gone and Peter with him. There was a long, awkward silence. Remus didn't trust himself to speak. Finally, James did. Sorry I've been a prat lately. Remus was taken aback and shook his head furiously. You shouldn't have been. I just wish I could prove to you that I... Wait! Ah! Ask me! Eh? Ask me now where I'm under truth serum. Ask me how I feel about Lily. You'll know it's the truth. Remus, I don't want to. James frowned. It didn't mesh with his idea of good sportsmanship. Go on, Remus encouraged. I really don't mind. It's between you and me, right? He got up and grabbed James by the shoulders, meeting his eyes with confidence. Ask me. Uh, okay then. Remus, do you fancy Lily Evans? No, absolutely not. Remus didn't so much as blink. Okay, good. What about Marlene? Nope. Never have, never will. They're my friends, like you are. James looked at him very intently, then his face broke into a genuine smile. He slapped Remus on the back. Thanks, Mooney. You're a real mate. Remus laughed. Any time. Fortunately for Remus, Slughorn was able to provide an antidote almost immediately, though the Marauder's Code of Honor prevented them from telling him who'd laced Remus's drink in the first place. It's better this way, Remus reassured them. It'll make him really nervous if he doesn't get in trouble straight away. He'll wonder how we're going to get back at him. How are we going to get him back? Sirius asked eagerly over breakfast on the morning of the Slytherin vs. Gryffindor game. He nearly outed you, Mooney. We have to teach him a lesson. Let me think about it, Remus replied. Just thrash Slytherin at Quidditch for me first. Easy, Sirius winked. Remus grinned back. It was hard not to grin at Sirius when he was in such a good mood, resplendent in his scarlet and gold Quidditch robes, hair pulled off his face, eyes sharp and full of determination. It was the best version of Sirius, and Remus's heart pounded with pride and adrenaline. The tension was palpable in the Quidditch stands before the players had even appeared on the pitch. Two quarters of the stadium were covered in red, jeering and booing at the green section. Quidditch had become a way for the students of Hogwarts to show their emotions about the war and it was extremely ugly. Tensions are high in this year's semi-final, the commentator, Tracy Darcy, spoke through a magical megaphone. This match will of course determine which team goes through to the final against Ravenclaw, and by the looks of the players, it'll be a close one. On Gryffindor, we have Potter, of course, a legend in his own right, with more than 200 goals under his belt already. Marlene McKinnon here, a formidable beater, and so she should be. Her brother Danny McKinnon, of course, plays professionally for the Chudley Cannons. And there's Sirius Black, Gryffindor's second beater, in his second game of the year. Black has already shown himself to be as competent as McKinnon, and I'm sure all the ladies will agree, doesn't look half bad in his kit. Ahem! McGonagall's disapproving cough could be heard over the megaphone. Remus noticed that almost every girl in the crowd was either giggling or screaming Sirius's name. Sorry, Professor, Tracy continued. And here comes Slytherin! Deafening booing from the crowd here. They have their very own black on the team, of course, Sirius's younger brother Regulus, Seeker, and Mulciber, taken on as Beta this term. The boos grew so loud now that Remus could barely hear Darcy over the noise. Peter wasn't helping and kept jumping up and down in his seat. Remus was staying seated as long as he could. His hip was causing him problems again, and he didn't want to exacerbate it. Limpy Lupin was worse than Looney Lupin, somehow. 
Finally, the game began and both the teams shot into the air with incredible force. If the crowd was mean, the players were even worse. As the weight of their houses on their shoulders, it felt like a matter of life or death. Remus had never seen James play so hard, rocketing up and down the pitch like a red bullet, catching and throwing the quaffle faster than the Slytherin keeper could keep track of. Sirius and Marlene were equally fearsome, both working as much more of a team than they had last time, clearly communicating and watching the backs of their fellow teammates. And they really needed to. Slytherin was playing dirty. Twice Sirius had to fend off a bludger that had accidentally flown right into James's path, while Marlene became the Gryffindor Seeker's shadow, protecting him from some very nasty near misses. Remus was so busy watching his three friends, wincing when they came close to danger, cheering their victories, that he'd quite forgotten the aim of the game. So had everyone else, it seemed, except for Regulus Black, who flew high above the pitch and then around the outskirts, showing that infamous Slytherin cunning as he sought out the snitch. No one was watching as Regulus Black, the smaller Slytherin team member, caught sight of the tiny golden ball and began to soar down toward it from incredible heights. No one was watching Regulus Black because they were all watching Sirius swinging his bat at a bludger that would have easily knocked him off his broom. He hit it back so hard that it shot straight back toward Mulciber's face. Mulciber, though stupid, was not slow and swooped down immediately, ducking out of the way, just as Regulus passed him. Now Remus saw him. Now everyone did, and a terrible shriek went up as the bludger connected with Regulus's head and knocked him from his broom. They watched in such horror that all house prejudice were forgotten as the limp body of Regulus Black plummeted to the ground. Chapter 67, Fourth Year, February Part 2 Notes Warning for really unpleasant parent-child interaction Note Yes, I know I have been spelling Walperga with a P instead of a B. That is how it will have to stay. Remus almost missed what happened because everyone in the crowd immediately stood up, jostling to see the disaster unfold. Fortunately, when Remus stood up, he was a great deal taller than those around him. Sirius tried. No one could deny that. The moment he saw the bludger hit Regulus, he bent flat on his broom and shot forward as if the devil were at his heels, faster than Remus had ever seen anyone, even James, fly. In fact, Sirius gathered at such a speed and at such a terrifying vertical angle that Remus felt sure he was going to crash to the ground too, and his stomach lurched with fear. Sirius was too late, but Madame Hooch was not. She stood on the grass, wand raised, and managed to slow Regulus's descent so that his body appeared to be falling through water, not air. By the time Sirius hit the ground, dropping his broom and pelting toward his brother, Regulus was lying so peacefully he could have been sleeping. Sirius was on his knees, the rest of the team were landing round him, McGonagall was shouting something over the megaphone, and a crowd quickly surrounded the two black brothers so that no one could see anything. Remus began to hobble down the wooden steps as quickly as his wonky hip would allow. Peter scurried along behind him. "'Where are you going?' he panted. "'Serious,' was all Remus could think to say. But once they reached ground level, they couldn't get onto the pitch. The heads of houses were shepherding students back to the castle and wouldn't let them pass. "'They must have taken Regulus to the hospital wing,' Peter said. "'Maybe Sirius is in the changing rooms?' "'No.' Remus shook his head. No, he'd probably want to go with Reg. He probably thinks it's all his fault. Well, Peter looked up at him. He did hit the bludger, didn't he? Remus clenched his fists and fought the urge to hit Peter. I'm going to the hospital wing, then. He turned and began to stride awkwardly toward the castle, trying to get ahead of everyone. What about James? Peter had to jog to keep up. He'll be there, too, Remus replied. And of course he was. When Peter and Remus arrived outside the hospital wing, having battled their way through the throngs of gossiping students, they found James sitting on the floor outside, elbows resting on his knees, staring into space. He was still in his Quidditch robes, his cheeks were still flushed from flying, and his hair was a mess. "'Is he okay?' Remus asked at once, and he wasn't sure who he meant. "'Yeah, I think so,' James looked up at them in dazed surprise. "'Knocked out cold, though. Pomfrey won't let me in.' "'Serious?' Yeah, he's in there. Thought I'd better wait. Slughorn's contacting their parents, so... He shrugged. Thought I'd better be here. We're all here, Remus said firmly, sitting down next to James with some difficulty. His hip was really sore now. The pain shot all the way down from pelvis to ankle. Peter actually squatted down too, and they waited. 
Did you see what happened? James asked finally. I was on the other end of the pitch. I didn't... A bludger, Remus said. Mulsaba hit one right at Sirius. It had to be a foul. Sirius hit it back at him, but Mulsaba got out of the way, and Regulus was right behind him. Sirius couldn't have seen him. It was an accident. It was... It was horrible. Shit, James said. They were quiet for a bit longer. It was starting to grow dark and the candles on the sconces along the wall began to light themselves. Remus wondered what Peter and James were thinking. Were they more worried about Sirius than Regulus, like he was? He felt a bit guilty, but Madame Pomfrey had been putting him back together since he was eleven years old and he didn't think that a bludger to the head was beyond her abilities. What concerned him more was the state Sirius would be in. He had thrown hexes at Regulus a hundred times, but he had never, ever hurt his little brother intentionally. This hadn't been intentional either, but Remus knew in his gut that Sirius wouldn't see it that way. They were disturbed from their thoughts by the quick clacking of high heels on flagstones and Professor McGonagall's worried voice coming round the corner. Please, Walpurga, he couldn't be in safer hands with Madame Pomfrey. It really is best he isn't moved. I think I shall be making the decisions here, Minerva. The cold, low voice replied. James and Peter leapt up nervously, and James bent to help Remus to his feet. None of them had seen Sirius's mother since that awful Christmas two years ago, and their terror of her was still fresh. McGonagall and Mrs. Black came charging round the corner, while Perga in her thick black travelling cloak and sharp high-heeled boots. She had the same look of cruel superiority Remus remembered, but her forehead was creased too, and her hair wasn't as neat as usual. She was accompanied by a small elderly wizard with a long trailing beard carrying a heavy-looking dragon-skin case. While Perga glanced at the three boys waiting outside the hospital wing and Remus held his breath, but she didn't think it worth her time and strode past, pushing the wooden doors open with both hands and marching inside. Remus, James and Peter peered in from the hallway to watch the scene unfold. McGonagall and the bearded wizard hurried in after Mrs. Black. Regulus was lying in bed, and from what they could tell, was still unconscious, or maybe just sleeping. With his eyes closed and at a distance, he looked remarkably like Sirius, which made Remus's stomach lurch again. But Sirius was sitting beside him, wide awake in his red Gryffindor robes, one foot propped up on a stool. He looked very pale and much smaller than usual. His eyes were red. He seemed to shrink even further as his mother approached, swooping toward her sons like some terrible vampire bat. Madame Pomfrey stepped in just then. He's quite all right, just a heavy shock, she said reassuringly. I've given him a healing draught and mended the fractures. Fractures? Walpurga said sharply. She stood at the end of Regulus's bed, looking down at him. She didn't try to reach out for him, or Sirius, but stood as still as a statue. Very minor and completely healed now, Madame Pomfrey said. He'll be up and about tomorrow morning. Now, Sirius has... This is our family physician, Walperga interrupted, extending a hand to introduce the wizened old man beside her. He will be taking over my son's care. I'm taking him home as soon as he has been thoroughly examined. I'm telling you, everything that can be done has been done, Madame Pomfrey said, sounding rather angry now. Walperga looked down at her impatiently. Within your competence, I'm sure, but he is my son and I will care for him as I see fit. Madame Pomfrey turned red in the face and appeared to be quite speechless, so that McGonagall had to lean over and whisper something in her ear to mollify her. The old bearded wizard placed his case on the bedside table and opened it, before silently bending over Regulus. Meanwhile, while Perga had turned her attention to her elder son, she did not move from the end of the bed, but her hawkish glare was enough to hold Sirius in place. You, she said, what are you doing here? Sirius said something, but it came out barely above a whisper, while Perga frowned. What? Speak up, boy! He's my brother, Sirius said louder now, though his voice was hoarse and cracked slightly. Mrs. Black tutted. For goodness sake, have you been crying? Try to show at least a modicum of decorum. Toujours poor, Sirius, try to remember your duty. Sirius didn't reply but bowed his head, his hair falling in front of his face. Remus hoped for his sake he hadn't begun to cry again. Walperga continued. You may leave, Sirius. Your father and I will see you in June. With that, she turned back to Regulus and did not acknowledge Sirius again. 
James started forward, unable to watch any longer, but Remus held back with Peter. It didn't feel like his place somehow. He didn't have the right. And though Remus wished more than anything he knew what to do, James was always so much better with Sirius. McGonagall had apparently seen James and acted very quickly, placing a hand on Sirius's shoulder and gently guiding him out of his chair and toward the doorway. He was limping slightly. Madame Pomfrey joined them halfway and handed Sirius a draught too. Straight up to bed and drink every drop, you hear me? You shouldn't be in too much pain, but it'll be uncomfortable tonight. Sirius nodded warily, not speaking. James clapped him on the shoulder and squeezed, then nodded to McGonagall. She looked very much like she wanted to say something, but held her tongue, only glancing back at Regulus and Mrs. Black. She would keep an eye on the situation, Remus was sure. She would let Sirius know if anything happened. The former orders walked most of the way to Gryffindor Tower together in dead silence until they came to a dual staircase, and Peter said suddenly, We've missed dinner! James and Remus glared at him, and he looked very hurt. What I meant, he squeaked angrily, I'll go down to the kitchens and have them send something up for us, if that's all right with you two. Nice one, Pete, James said apologetically. Remus just ducked his head, looking away. Peter turned tail and headed downstairs, while the other three kept going upstairs. It was slow progress, considering two of them had pronounced limps. Right state we must look, Sirius muttered humorously, as they paused on one of the landings for a breather. What's wrong with you anyway? Remus finally asked, rubbing his aching hip. Broke my ankle, Sirius said. Landed too hard on it. James winced. Sirius shrugged. Can't feel it, just a bit wobbly. When they finally reached their bedroom, Sirius locked himself inside the bathroom to shower and change. Peter shortly reappeared, laden with sandwiches, fruit, chocolate, cakes, and anything else he could carry. Bunch of girls down there want to see Sirius, he huffed, dumping everything onto his bed. There's a gang of second years all making him get well cards. Told him to bugger off. Thanks, Pete, James said. You're a good mate. Peter smiled, finally. He nodded at the closed bathroom door. He okay? He will be, James sighed, stripping off his Quidditch robes, leaving them in a pile on the floor. In just his vest and underwear, he grabbed a chicken sandwich from Peter's bed and bit into it hungrily. Peter and Remus took this as permission and followed suit. Sirius was in the bathroom for a long time, and they thought it best to just leave him to it. James changed into his usual clothes and began tidying Sirius's eternally messy bed. Remus helped, collecting up the scattered books and half-finished essays. He would finish them, Remus decided. He would do all of Sirius's homework for the entire week, if it helped at all. I fucking hate his family, James said suddenly as he shook out one of Sirius's pillows. His mum's worse than mine, Peter sniffed. Remus began to sort through Sirius's notes, smoothing out the parchments and trying to make sense of what was due when. The bathroom door opened and Sirius emerged in his pyjamas, his hair wet and combed. You hungry, mate? Peter asked nervously, offering a plate of sandwiches. Sirius shook his head and walked toward his bed. Just gonna go to sleep, he muttered, pulling the curtains across. Sirius! Remus burst out, before he suddenly disappeared from view. Sirius stopped, staring at him through the gap in the hanging. Remus chewed his lip. It wasn't your fault, he said. I was watching. It was an accident. You were both just so focused on the game, that's all. Sirius looked at him, his face soft after the shower, his eyes tired and dark. He smiled gently and shrugged. Still did it. Then drew the curtains tight shut. The Quidditch game was declared incomplete and both teams agreed to a rematch once the Slytherins had found another seeker. The next morning at breakfast, the Slytherin captain received a howler from Walperga Black, accusing him of putting her son in danger. Regulus was not present and rumours abounded, but McGonagall had privately told Sirius that all was well. Mrs. Black simply wished to keep Regulus at home for a further week as a precaution. Sirius carried on about his day, but the light in him had dimmed. He didn't hex anyone, make jokes, or even talk out of turn in his lessons. He simply pushed through as if sleepwalking. Remus had started to wonder whether it was still the shock of the accident or the anxiety of having to face his mother inside Hogwarts. That night was the full moon, so Remus could be of little help to Sirius. 
Actually, he was a little bit glad to have the excuse to get away from the dorm room, which had become a dismal quiet place when Sirius was in his mood. Remus wasn't the only one. Peter kept slipping away to visit Desdemona. Perhaps it was all of the quiet, all of the unsaid things and unresolved tension, but February's moon was a bad one. Remus awoke with his throat burnt raw from howling, splinters under his fingernails, and bruises all over. Lately, he'd noticed, the older he got, the more he was able to remember after the transformations. It still wasn't very clear, like remembering a dream, images and feelings swimming in and out of sight, but this time Remus thought that maybe the wolf had wanted something. Maybe it had wanted to get out more than usual. He lay in the hospital bed, trying to remember, feverish and headachy, too uncomfortable to sleep, sheets twisted round his ankles like manacles. Morning, Mooney. A soft, sad voice spoke to him. He had to rub his eyes and blink a few times before he even realised it was serious. M morning he slurred, groggy from whatever painkiller he'd been supplied. It always made his accent slip, which he hated. What are you doing here? Sirius sat on the end of the bed and stuck out his foot. Check up on my ankle. It's fine now. Oh, good. Remus nodded, trying to pull himself up into a sitting position and failing miserably. How was it? Sirius asked, gesturing broadly at Remus's body. Fine, Remus replied. Normal. James here too. Ah, Sirius looked down at his shoes, giving him a break from me. I don't think he minds. I do, though. Remus nodded. He didn't like being fussed over either. Mooney? Yeah. You know how you said it wasn't my fault? It wasn't your fault, Remus said firmly, a little bit too firmly. He felt the muscles in his throat strain and contract and he began to cough. Sirius hopped off the bed and grabbed the glass of water from the nightstand, handing it to Remus. Remus gulped it down, embarrassed, spilling a little down his throat. I didn't hit him on purpose, you're right, Sirius said, looking out the window over Remus's head, squinting, slightly as if he were looking for something out there. But when I saw him fall like that, I thought, I thought, don't let him die. Well, of course, Remus frowned. He wished Sirius would meet his eye. He's your brother. Of course you wouldn't want him to... I wasn't thinking about him, though, Sirius said. I was thinking about me. I was thinking, if he dies, then I'll be the only one left and my parents will... I wouldn't have any way out. I need Regulus to stay alive. I need him to be the perfect son. So it doesn't matter that I'm the bad son. That's what I was thinking. I'm a coward. Remus didn't know what to say, but he had to say something. You'd have still been sorry if he died, though. Not just because of that. Yeah, but my first thought... People don't think properly when they're scared. Believe me, Remus said, hoping he sounded authoritative. I saw you. You risked your life to try and save him. That's not cowardly. Broke your stupid ankle like the idiotic, hard-headed Gryffindor you are. Sirius exhaled, strained a little laugh. He looked at his feet again, then at Remus. Remus smiled at him encouragingly, even though his jaw ached. Greg gonna be okay? Yeah, fine. Owled me this morning, being waited on hand and foot, it sounds like. Mother tried to get me kicked off the team, too, but he stopped her. There you go, then, Remus smirked. You're still the bad son. Sirius laughed. Chapter 68, Fourth Year, March Content Warning for Underage Drinking and Smoking Considering the events of the spring term, Remus was not expecting much of a celebration as his 15th birthday approached. Of course, the marauders were as pleased as ever to prove him wrong. As usual, everything was planned with extreme secrecy and Remus was completely unaware until the very last moment. It was the Saturday before his birthday, and he'd been lounging on his bed reading, with one of Sirius's records playing low in the background. He often borrowed the record player and camped out in his bed these days. Sirius never seemed to mind. It was only about nine o'clock, but he was alone, and considering an early night. Just as he'd made his mind up to get into his pyjamas, Sirius burst into the room with a wicked grin on his face that could only mean one thing. It was going to be a long night. 
Ready? He said, bounding across the room, bringing in the smell of wood smoke from the common room fireplace. For what? Remus asked calmly, marking his place and setting his book aside. For your birthday surprise, obviously! Sirius sighed, as if Remus was being very slow. Come on, up you get. Shoes on, please. Wear those mad muggle boots you've got with the crazy laces. Uh, where are we going? Out! Sirius began digging round in his trunk. He withdrew a pair of muggle jeans and a plain black t-shirt. Oh, you mean out, out! Remus raised an eyebrow as Sirius began to undress. Yeah, take your cloak! Sirius looked good in muggle clothes, Remus thought to himself. Really, most people look better in a t-shirt and jeans than they did in a school uniform or 17th century robes, but Sirius wore everything well. Remus asked no further questions as he laced up his boots. It was clear that Sirius was enjoying the surprise, and he saw no reason to spoil it. He was led down the stairs, feeling very odd in jeans and a travelling cloak, but not complaining. Sirius probably thought they looked the height of muggle fashion. In the common room, they were met by James and Peter, also grinning mischievously. You know my birthday isn't for two days yet, Remus said, a small smile of his own playing on his lips. Tonight's events are time-sensitive, Sirius replied briskly. He was trying to retain an aloof air of mystery, but was clearly bursting to tell Remus everything. And don't you worry, James said, eyes twinkling as he held back the portrait door to exit the common room. We won't forget to sing for you on Monday at breakfast. And lunch, Peter added. And dinner, Sirius finished. Now they were wending their way down the Gryffindor Tower staircase. Under you go, lads, James said, throwing the heavy invisibility cloak all over the four of them. As long as they all stayed very close together and Remus hunched over, they just about fit. It wouldn't stand another growth spurt from any of them, though. Fortunately, they didn't have to shuffle too far. As Remus had expected, they headed for the statue of the humpback witch and slipped behind it into the tunnel which led into Honeydukes. So, fifteen! Sirius said cheerfully as they walked, clapping Remus on the shoulder in what he might have considered a very manly sort of way. Excited? Remus shrugged. I never really thought about it. You tell me, you're the oldest. Well, obviously I'm much wiser and more mature than the rest of you. James snorted, walking ahead with his wand lit. Sirius ignored him. I'd rather be seventeen, though. Then we could apparate at least. Oh, don't start, Peter huffed, bringing up the rear. He actually wanted to learn how to apparate, Remus, for your birthday, so we could get into Hogsmeade f easier. Can't apparate inside Hogwarts, Remus said. Ten points to Mooney, Sirius grinned. We could have apparated out of the cellar, though, save us having to try and get past old Honeyduke. Apparition is really hard, though, isn't it? Remus asked. He secretly wasn't sure if he'd be able to do it at all. Even doing a side along with Mr. Potter that once had been exhausting and made him feel sick. Yeah, but we could do it, Sirius replied confidently. It was a bit much on top of everything else we had to do this term, though, Peter said. Sirius gave the smaller boy a very annoyed look, and Peter's mouth dropped open, as if he'd said something very wrong. You mean with exams coming up? Remus asked innocently to save Peter. He was amazed Pettigrew had managed to keep quiet for so long as it was, though it wasn't as if James and Sirius were half as discreet as they thought they were. Yeah, exactly, Peter sounded relieved. Exams! I'm definitely going to fail History of Magic this year. Definitely. I'll never get an OWL in it. They talked about the next year's OWLs for a bit longer, bemoaning their own unpreparedness in this subject or that, though Remus was actually quite looking forward to them, especially the practical exams. Finally, they reached the Honeyduke cellar, and this was where the plan somewhat fell apart. Bugger, James said as he tried the locked door. He's usually still up doing his accounts or whatever. Must have gone to bed early. Or he could be out, Remus suggested. It's a Saturday night. What are we going to do? Peter asked. Aloha, Mora. Oh, but we can't do magic. Let me see. Remus stepped forward, fiddling in his back pocket for the hairpin he'd had since summer. Easy, 
he said, inspecting the lock. He bent over it, inserted the pin, stroking it slowly upwards and listening carefully. The satisfying click told him it had worked, and he stepped back, opening the door with a flourish. Ta-da! You beauty! James cheered. Come on, let's go! Once inside the shop, it was even easier, as that lock worked from the inside. Then, all of a sudden, they were outside on Hogsmeade High Street in the cold night air. It was deliciously thrilling. Being somewhere they shouldn't, Remus didn't even care if they got away with it or not. He followed Sirius and James up the cobbled street, past the three broomsticks, the clothes shops, and post office. The two excitable boys stopped abruptly outside another pub, one Remus hadn't been to before. The sign swinging above the entrance said, The Hog's Head, with an appropriately gory image beneath. There was an A-frame chalkboard on the pavement outside which read, Live music tonight! Open mic! Muggle tribute acts! Oh my god! Remus exclaimed. This was absolutely the last thing he'd expected. Now he knew why Sirius was grinning so broadly his cheeks must hurt. What do you think? The dark-haired boy asked earnestly. Sirius promised us you'd love it, James said, sounding less sure. Remus just stared at the chalkboard, then at Sirius. I love it, he confirmed. Inside, it was neither very busy nor too quiet, and looked as though the first act was just setting up. It wasn't as nice as the three broomsticks. There was straw on the floor rather than a carpet, and it smelled faintly of a farmyard. But Remus could see that they definitely weren't going to bump into anyone they knew, and no one was going to grass on them to the school. I'll get the first round in, Sirius said merrily, mischief still twinkling in his eyes. Sirius? James said, sternly. Butterbeers, yeah? Hmm. So, Remus said as they settled themselves round a small rickety table which was close enough to the band, but also in a gloomy corner just in case. Muggle tribute acts? Is that a normal thing for wizards to listen to? Nah, James shook his head, looking just as baffled. There's been a bit of a trend for it lately, defying the Dark Lord and all his pure blood shite, that sort of thing. Are they going to play David Bowie? Peter asked. Poor Peter had the impression that Muggle music began and ended with David Bowie, thanks to Sirius and Remus. The band announced themselves as the Banshee Blues just as Sirius returned with a tray of drinks, about fifteen of them. Sirius? James raised his eyebrows. What? Sirius winked at him. I got your butterbeer. I meant just butterbeer, for all of us. How did you even get served? Is that fire whiskey? And mead? Sirius nodded. Don't drink any if you don't want it. Here. He picked up a glass with about two inches of golden brown coloured liquid in it, raising it. To our beloved Mooney, inventor of the Marauder's Map, architect of our greatest pranks, completer of our overdue homework. To Mooney! The other two smirked. Remus looked at the band, too embarrassed to respond. He'd never seen live music performed before, let alone live music performed by wizards. Their clothes were predictably odd a mix of traditional robes and assorted muggle garments. The lead singer wore a white Stetson, for some reason, paired with a pink feather boa. The instruments looked mugglish enough, but they had no amplifiers. Apparently magic took care of the volume. They played a few Beatles songs, then some Rolling Stones, and Remus thought they were pretty good. Even James was tapping his foot along by the end, though that might have been due to Sirius sneaking measures of fire whiskey into his butterbeer. Fire whiskey was pretty foul, Remus thought, but no worse than the cheap vodka he'd been knocking back last summer. He proudly swallowed his first glass in one without wincing, and Sirius stared at him in awe. Peter stuck to mead and kept asking, Am I drunk yet? Am I drunk? After every sip. After two flagons, he probably was. Maybe we should just stick to butterbeer now, Remus said, eyeing Peter with concern. He was swaying on his stool slightly, pink-cheeked and grinning. Banshee Blues were packing away their instruments, and a pale-faced young woman with a drippy fringe approached the mic stand. "'That you, Lupin?' a young wizard approached them from the bar. Remus vaguely recognised him, but wasn't sure where from. "'Uh, hi,' he said nervously. "'Arnold Doyle! I was at Hogwarts last year, remember?' 
He was tall and lanky, but so were half the boys at school. Your fags got me through my newt! Oh, right, yeah. Hi, Arnold. Sorry. He still wasn't sure he remembered him, but the whiskey had made him feel friendly and warm towards everyone. What are you doing here? Girlfriend's playing! He nodded up at the stage where the drippy-looking girl was tuning her acoustic guitar. What about you? Thought you were still at school. It's my birthday, Remus grinned. Snuck out, innit? Arnold laughed. Gotcha! Well, I won't club you in. Can I buy you a drink? Say thanks for the cigs. You're our kind of man, Arnold! Sirius called out more loudly than he needed to in such a small pub, but he'd been matching Remus drink for drink. Arnold just laughed and went back to the bar. His girlfriend started playing, a Bob Dylan song, it sounded like, but Remus wasn't that familiar with folk. He still couldn't remember ever having sold Arnold anything, but Arnold clearly felt a debt was owed because he bought Remus an entire bottle of fire whiskey and set it down on the table. Happy birthday! Come of age, have you? Actually, Peter started, then stopped as Sirius kicked him hard under the table. Yeah, Remus replied smoothly. Cheers! After that, things went a bit wobbly, but he definitely decided smoking was a good idea, and Sirius, keen not to be outdone, agreed. Those things stink, Mooney, James complained, pulling a face. And what does he mean your fags got him through his N.E.W.T.'s? Ma, he must have confused me with someone, Remus shrugged. Sirius burst into hysterical giggling. The next band, in Remus's opinion, was the best. They were called Dragonhide and played a lot of Slade, Status Quo and Black Sabbath. It made Remus want to get up and dance, but he wasn't as drunk as Sirius or Peter and had not completely lost his inhibitions. He couldn't help singing along toward the end, though, as almost everyone in the pub was by this point. It seemed somehow like such a good idea to get up on his chair, waving his glass above his head as the whole pub roared, so come on, feel the noise, grab your boys, get wild, 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 we get wild, wild, wild. Sirius, of course, thought this was great fun, and after two attempts to climb onto his own stool, quickly caught by James, who was in better command of his faculties, ended up with his arms slung round James and Peter, swinging this way and that, singing at the top of his voice, so you think we have a lazy time? Well, you should know better. And I don't know why, I just don't know why. And you say I got a dirty mind? Well, I'm a mean go-getter. And I don't know why, and I don't know why anymore. Oh, no. In fact, the marauders were all so taken by this hook that they were still singing it as loudly as they could as they staggered back through Hogsmeade to the high street, arm in arm, tripping and laughing as they went. Out in the cold air, Remus felt a bit sharper and slightly guilty as he realised what a state Sirius and Peter were in. By the time they got to Honeydukes, it must have been well past midnight. They snuck inside as quietly as possible and headed for the cellar. James and Remus desperately trying to herd Sirius and Peter away from all the sweets on display. The walk back through the tunnel to Hogwarts was pretty dreadful. Peter could barely keep his eyes open and staggered against James, complaining he had a headache. Sirius bounced from wall to wall, seeming only held upright by his own forward momentum, occasionally bursting into snatches of song. At the end of the tunnel, James and Remus were very much sober. Peter was barely conscious and Sirius was looking worryingly green. Merlin, how are we going to get them back up to bed without waking up the whole castle? James huffed, still supporting Peter. Sirius promptly leaned over and threw up. Christ! Remus grabbed his shoulders as he was in danger of toppling forward into the pool of sick. He pulled Sirius's hair back quickly and patted his friend on the back. Er, uh, he looked at James. Why don't you take Peter under the cloak? It'll be easier. I'll wait a bit with him. He jerked his head at Sirius. Then summon the cloak in half an hour or so? Easier with two, anyway. Good plan, James said gratefully. You sure you don't want me to watch him? Sirius sat on the ground, very suddenly head in his hands and groaning. No, I've looked after pissheads before, Remus smirked. Hugo, cheers for the birthday, James. It was bloody brilliant. 
James flashed him a smile before disappearing under the invisibility cloak with Peter still clinging on for dear life. Remus sighed and sat himself down next to Sirius. He pointed his wand at the mess opposite. Scourgeify! And it was clean. Sirius groaned again and rested his head on Remus's shoulder. Remus chuckled softly. All right there, mate. <coughs> yeah, sounds about right. Hey, don't puke on me, okay? Thirsty? Yeah. Remus drank the last of his bottle of fire whiskey, then touched his wand to the opening. Aguamenti! And it filled with crystal clear cold water. He handed it to Sirius. Don't drink it too fast or you'll puke! Sirius sipped it a bit, eyes still closed. His face was a bit pale and clammy, but he still looked ten times better than Remus probably did. You're so good at this stuff, Rooney, he slurred, leaning heavily on Remus's shoulder. Yeah, Remus grunted, picking locks and holding my drink. Your magic, Sirius murmured sleepily. Yeah, we're wizards, idiot. I'm good at magic, Sirius sighed. But you, like... You like arm magic. Yeah. You're drunk and calling talking bollocks, Remus laughed. Oi, don't fall asleep. I've got to get you back. Sharon. Sirius replied, nodding off. Remus sighed and wondered if anyone would notice if they just stayed put. Saturday, 26th of April, 1975. Remus Lupin, put that book down at once! Madam Pomfrey's shrill, tired voice echoed across the infirmary floor. Remus dropped the heavy textbook, looking up, startled. Can you see through the screen? He called back. He thought he was practically alone. No, she replied. I just know you too well. She appeared, stepping around the pale green hospital screens. It was lighter, beyond them. Pomfrey had cast a spell which created a capsule of darkness round Remus's bed, so that he could get some sleep, she said. She snatched up the book, giving him a stern look. I'd hoped you'd be resting your eyes, not straining them. I can see in the dark, he shrugged. It was true. No matter how much punishment his body took, his eyes remained perfect. Better than perfect, even. No excuse, Madame Pomfrey tutted. As you're up, I suppose you're ready for visitors. Yeah, of course. He sat up, eagerly, straightening his nightshirt. Come on, then, she called to James, Sirius, and Peter, who appeared single file from behind the screen. Not too much noise, and no books. Why can't you have books? James asked, leaning over the end of the bed frame. Because it's moony, Sirius said, flinging himself bodily across the small single bed right over Remus's legs. He doesn't understand moderation. I just want to revise, Remus sighed, rubbing the back of his head. I mean, I'm at school. It's what I'm supposed to do. He accepted a chocolate frog from Peter, who was handing them out. You don't want to burn out, though. Sirius said, his own mouth full of chocolate. You're miles ahead of the rest of the class, and exams are for ages. They're two weeks away, James said, nibbling at his own piece of chocolate, surprisingly daintily. You could do with being a bit better prepared, Black. Oh, I am sorry. Sirius rolled his blue eyes dramatically, rolling onto his back. Remus winced. I forgot you'd join the swap club, too. One afternoon in the library does not make me a swat, James frowned, clearly offended. Don't listen to him, James, Remus grinned. I'm proud of you. Thanks for the frogs, Pete. Oh, they're not from me, Peter said, settling into the armchair beside the bed. Desi says she hopes you get well soon. Remus, Peter and James all turned their heads at once. Desi, Sirius said, sitting up. You mean Desdemona? Uh, 
yeah? Peter stopped chomping chocolate and started looking nervous. She asked me why I couldn't see her today, so I told her I was seeing Mooney. What? He looked from James to Sirius. I didn't say anything about why he was sick. I just said, you idiot. Sirius jumped down from the bed. Sirius, Remus hissed. If they were too loud, Madam Pomfrey would chase them out. It's fine, really. It's not fine, Sirius seethed. He was standing over Peter now. You can't go telling everyone Remus is in the hospital wing. Not everyone is as slow on the uptake as you. Doesn't the word secret mean anything to you? You know it does, Peter said, jutting out his chin, his lower lip trembling. He kept all sorts of... He glanced furtively at Remus, then changed tact. Anyway, Desi's not everyone. She's my good friend. So what? Sirius raged. You're going to tell every tart that lets you stick your slimy tongue down her throat? Peter's eyes filled with furious tears. He sniffed hard and rubbed his nose, standing up. Just because I've got a girlfriend, just because... Because some of us actually like spending time with girls. Sirius's face seemed to transform into a new, terrible kind of rage that Remus had never seen before. His heart was pounding a mile a minute. Remus could hear it clear as a bell. What are you trying to say, Pettigrew? That I'd rather be with Desi than you lot right now. Sorry, Remus. Peter said very quickly before departing, storming out of the ward with a newly confident stride. There was a steely presence, and Remus found he couldn't bring himself to look at Sirius. Whatever emotion he was working through seemed like something which ought to be private. He looked at James instead, still standing at the foot of the bed, chewing his lip. He met Remus's eye and gave him a reassuring smile. Moody pair of buggers, eh? He broke the tension. Anyway, how are you feeling? Moon go okay? Yeah, no scars, Remus nodded, slowly aware of Sirius's heart still beating loudly at his shoulder. Nothing broken either. Maybe I'm finally getting good at being a werewolf. What did he mean? Sirius said suddenly, turning to look at James. I don't know, mate, Potter shrugged. Don't listen to him. He gave as good as he got. You're just miffed because he finally stuck up for himself. He meant something, Sirius muttered. How's Quidditch going? Remus asked quickly. Ready for the final? James's brow smoothed instantly, and he straightened up, eager to tell Remus all about his big plans for the upcoming Ravenclaw game. The Slytherin-Gryffindor rematch had taken place in late March, and much to everyone's surprise, Regulus Black had resumed his role as Seeker. James had quietly told Remus afterwards that Regulus had threatened half of the Slytherins with painful disfigurement charms if word got back to Walperga that he was back on the team. Gryffindor had won by only five points, which was lucky, because Remus couldn't imagine Sirius being in a worse mood than he already was. Things had not been good. For his part, Remus had been trying to be extra kind to Sirius ever since February. Though Remus had always known that the Blacks were far from an ideal nurturing family unit, he'd always sort of assumed that it couldn't be that bad. After all, in his experience, adults were there to maintain order, to instruct, and to punish. James had had an extremely cushy time of it, as far as Remus was concerned, so it made sense that he was sympathetic towards Sirius. Perhaps it was maturity, or perhaps it was having seen Bright, vivacious Sirius, brought down low by his own mother. But Remus was finally beginning to understand that whatever went on in the noble and ancient House of Black was not normal. In fact, it was entirely unacceptable. The fact that Sirius had survived under such oppression for so long without turning into Snape or just cracking under the weight of it was remarkable. Remus knew how hard it was to push against other people's expectations, against your own nature sometimes. It was starting to show, though. Maybe since Remus's birthday, after Sirius had got himself so abhorrently drunk and they had holed up together in that cold tunnel. Though that just might have been when Remus first noticed it, it could well have started after Regulus's fall. But there had been a definite shift 
Sirius was tired, worn out, like Remus after a full moon. Some of the fight had left him, that much was clear. He still got angry, but it came in short bursts, and he was quickly sunk into a dark and quiet mood. The late-night conversations with James had resumed, too. Remus was not invited. He didn't exactly expect to be, but he thought that they'd got a bit closer that year and that maybe Sirius would choose to confide in both of them. But the only thing Sirius seemed to want from Remus these days was cigarettes. If Remus had the heart to charge him, he might have made a fortune. Sirius was rarely without a fag behind his ear or between his lips. Teenage mood swings, Lily had said decisively when Marlene mentioned that Sirius seemed out of sorts. Honestly, the redhead sighed, tossing her hair. He acts like everything that happens to him is some great drama, but he's no different than the rest of us. Hormones. Well, Mary frowned, his family is a bit of a nightmare. Dark wizards and that. Can't be easy with everything that's going on in the papers. Sirius isn't a dark wizard, Remus said immediately. I know that, Mary snapped. I just meant that he might be feeling a bit torn, that's all. She'd been snapping at Remus a lot since Snape's Veritaserum prank. Even though Remus had apologised profusely and many times, he couldn't deny that the things he'd said had been the truth. Sorry, he said again, ducking his head. You're right, he hasn't got it easy. You of all people shouldn't pity him, Remus. Lily huffed, slamming down an entirely new pile of revision books. What's that supposed to mean? He's had every advantage over you and still can't be a nice person, she said, dividing the books up between the four of them. He's ridiculously wealthy, pure blood, old magic, privately educated, has both his parents. Oh, he and Potter are so... James and Sirius are not that alike, was the only response Remus had. It seemed like everyone was in a bad mood. In the hospital wing, James had finally run out of things to say about the Ravenclaw match, which was scheduled for early May, just before exam started. He seemed to have noticed that Remus had tuned out and had fallen silent. Sirius was bored too and had started trying to transfigure various items around the bed. A lamp, an unused bedpan, the empty vase on the nightstand. Sorry, Remus said. It's a bit boring for you two here. You don't have to stay. Nonsense! James waved a hand carelessly. Nothing else to do around here. Ravenclaw have booked the pitch for the rest of the day, and Sirius won't come to the library with me, so... Potter had started putting extra effort into his studies that year for the first time, much to Sirius's disappointment. At first, Remus had thought it was another ploy to get close to Lily, but James never asked to be involved in their study group and actually appeared to prefer working alone. He told them that his parents had threatened to take his broom away for the summer if his results weren't better than last year, but Sirius had whispered to Remus afterwards that actually McGonagall had warned him that if he didn't pull his socks up, he wouldn't get a chance at being Quidditch captain. You can quiz me if you want, Remus said, cheering up a bit. Ask me stuff about potions, then I'll do whatever subject you want. History, James sighed. I'm crap at history. Ugh, well, if you're going to do that, I'll go, Sirius said, hauling himself up. I'm crap at all of it. No, you're not. Don't be stupid. Now nah, I'm off, Sirius shook his head, distracted. Maybe I'll go and find some girls to hang around with, since that's so important to everyone. Since when has the stuff Peter says bothered you? Remus frowned, but it was too late. Sirius was already leaving. Remus looked at James. James ran a hand through his hair. Sorry, Mooney. Just ignore him. It's not you. Or Peter, come to that. It's... He's got an owl from home this morning. Oh, right. Remus looked down. He should have realised. Yeah... They've told him he's got to go home for the whole summer this year. Learn his family duty once and for all, or some rubbish. He says he's going to be really bored, but... I don't know. I think he's scared, to be honest. 
Everyone says they're in pretty deep with you-know-who. He'll be okay, though, won't he? Remus fiddled with the corner of his bedsheet anxiously. He can't force him to marry anyone again, and he's not of age yet, so he can't join up or whatever. James shrugged. He looked very tired, too. I don't know, mate, he said softly. I don't know what they want. Anyway, I'm not going anywhere. Let's start with potions, shall we? Chapter 70 Fourth Year Partings Thursday, 29th of May, 1975 The exam period seemed to fly by that year. Remus really felt as though he'd gotten to the swing of things for the first time, and though he didn't like to rest on his laurels, was relatively certain he'd achieved decent marks all round. Even potions had been less stressful than usual, thanks to Lily's careful guidance and patient coaching throughout the year. In fact, by the third week of May, Remus found himself at something of a loose end. He'd completed all of his tests, none of his friends had, between muggle studies and divination, the marauders and the girls were still cloistered away studying in their exam hall. But he was far from lonely. Remus spent his free time taking leisurely walks in the grounds, reading whatever and whenever he liked, and putting the finishing touches to his greatest accomplishment, the Marauder's Map. It had been almost four years in the making, but Remus's original rudimentary map of Hogwarts had expanded and developed until it presented a comprehensive view of the entire castle, secret entrances, tunnels, and hidden chambers included. With the Marauder's help, it now moved and shifted in time with the rhythm of the building itself, located and identified every being present in the castle, and it worked beautifully. Remus had never been more proud of anything in his life. Indeed, he'd never created anything worth being proud of. It still needed some kind of locking spell. At present, he was able to have the ink disappear and reappear with a quick disillusionment charm, but that was not enough. Not if it was to leave their dorm room. That would be something to research over the summer. He'd already spoken to Madame Pince about borrowing a few books, with the understanding that he would reimburse her in full for any damage should it occur. Remus was looking forward to the summer, perhaps even less than usual. Now that he was fully aware of the political climate in the wizarding world, he found the thought of stepping outside of it for two months very disconcerting. Who knew what would happen in the meantime? Say nothing of the danger his friends might find themselves in. For the first summer since 1972, the marauders would be completely separated. Sirius had been forbidden from seeing the Potters. Remus would be at St. Edmund's as usual for his own safety, and the Pettigrews were going to America to visit Philomena. Peter suspected to try and bring her home. Sirius's situation was the most concerning. James had tried everything, even writing to Dumbledore, but no one was willing or able to override the Black family's wishes. Even Sirius had resigned himself to that fate. I'll have Reg, he sighed heavily. Maybe if he's not surrounded by Slytherins all the time, he'll listen to a bit of reason. He's old enough now. Remus had promised to write. Every day if Sirius wanted him to, even Mary had offered to try and visit, as she lived in London too. Of course, she was muggle-born, and it was entirely out of the question. James actually had an escape plan ready to enact the moment Sirius gave the word. It involved a complex chain of communication, his broom, and breaking at least ten wizarding laws, but they were all ready to do it. Even Peter, who'd forgiven Sirius's outburst in April, and had been forgiven in turn. Remus had thought about how to spend his own summer, and had already decided he would not be repeating the events of the last year. Not that he would turn down the chance to earn a bit of cash if it came his way. His plans to hunt down Greyback had not altered, and would still need financing. But he also needed to stay focused. Staying out all night drinking and fighting was not productive, nor did it solve any of his problems. He also knew that he needed to keep a low profile for as long as possible, and getting himself arrested for petty crime was not a clever move. Having spent a fair bit of time indoors lately completing the map, 
and the weather being neither too hot nor too cold for May, Remus decided to venture out onto the grounds to read. He'd finally read all the muggle books Sirius had brought with him to Hogwarts in their first year and was now borrowing from Lily. She was a big Jane Austen fan, which was a shame, as Remus wasn't, but he was making do with Emma all the same. He sat under the dappled shade of a big beech tree by the lake with his back to the whomping willow. As he'd feared, Remus soon grew bored of Miss Woodhouse's dreadful prattling. It turned out the stupid book was all about matchmaking, and he'd had plenty of that all year, thank you very much. He put the book down and leaned against the trunk, looking up at the brilliant green leaves, his eyelids slowly sighing shut. He had a very strange dream, though Remus would think to himself much later, all dreams are pretty odd, weren't they? He couldn't remember exactly what was going on in the dream, or where he was, or who was with him, but there was perhaps another person, another body at least, very close to his own. It was an intensely physical sensation, similar to his memories of being the wolf, but undoubtedly more pleasant. The way this other body fitted against his was deeply soothing, warm and satisfying, in a way he'd never felt before. Remus wasn't sure how long he slept for, but when he awoke there was chatter all around him. One of the exams had obviously finished and students were pouring out onto the grounds, exulting in their hard-won freedom. Remus blinked against the bright summer sunlight and straightened up, a bit embarrassed to have dozed off, not to mention the physical reaction the weird dream had prompted. He quickly rearranged his robes, looking about to check no one had noticed. His back was stiff and sore now, from leaning against the trunk. His mouth was dry and his left foot had gone numb. He stretched and shook it out, wincing as pins and needles shot up his leg. Watch her, Remus! A gruff, liverpudlian accent came from behind him. Not sleeping, were you? No, he said at once as Farox came into view. Remus grabbed up Emma and tried to pretend he'd only put it down for a moment. Farox smiled at him knowingly, but didn't make fun. He set down a heavy bucket of something slimy which smelled foul. Came to say goodbye to the squid, he nodded at the lake which was still as a mill pond. Are you going away for the summer, Professor? Remus asked, mildly interested as he rubbed his leg to get the blood flowing again. Hmm, Farrox nodded, squinting out at the lake. The summer and maybe longer. Afraid I won't see you in September. What? Remus blinked, startled. But who'll teach us care of magical creatures? Professor Kettleburn will be back. I was only ever filling in for him. Oh. Remus had sort of known all along, but it still came as a shock. He felt horribly sad. He'd never had to say goodbye to anyone he'd missed before. He'd a strong urge to tell Ferox this, to tell him how much he wished he could stay. But the words wouldn't come. It's a pity, was all he could mutter. He stood up shakily, legs still sore. Ferox dipped a hand into the bucket of slimy, silvery things and withdrew something long and wriggly. He flung it into the lake, and two tentacles broke the water's surface to catch it. Ferox smiled. I won't lie, I'll miss this place, he said, reaching in for another one. Squelch, he glanced at Remus. And me best class, of course. It's, it's my favourite subject, Remus said, all in a hot rush. I should think so, Ferox grinned, throwing another slithery thing. Splash. I'm not supposed to tell you your results until August, but I'm bloody proud of your lupin. Top marks in this year. Better than plenty of my old WL students. You're a good teacher, Remus said sadly. So's Kettleburn. Ferox reassured him, still feeding the squid. Squelch. Splash. Where are you going? Back to the ministry? Ah, no. Ferox's expression changed. He didn't frown exactly, but his features darkened. The smile faded. I've some business for Dumbledore. Not sure the ministry would... Anyway, it's not for you to worry about. He shook his head, then smiled again, looking down at Remus. I'll be abroad for a while. Squelch. Splash. Remus wondered if he would ever see Professor Ferox again. 
He still wasn't quite sure how big the wizarding community really was, but he didn't think it could be very large, not if there was only one school in Britain. Would it be okay to write to Farox, or was that inappropriate? He wouldn't write to someone like McGonagall, for example, or Professor Slughorn. I'll be asking Kettleburn for updates, you know, Farox said, reading his mind, so don't think you can start slacking. Us dead and oaks have to show the rest of the posh knobs how it's done, eh? Now more than ever. I won't slack off, Remus said fiercely. I promise. Ferox laughed and nudged Remus with an elbow. Good lad, you'd better be proud. Friday, 27th of June, 1975. It was the last Friday of term, all of the exams and lessons were finished for another year and Remus had made a mental list of all the packing he needed to do. This year, he and James had conspired together to ensure that all of Sirius has got done in time. James was gradually warming to the idea of letting Remus help when it came to Sirius's welfare. They planned that on Saturday morning, James and Peter would take him out for a few hours flying, while Remus would sort through everything. He promised he didn't mind anything that might help. They were all sitting around at dinner, nothing special, just fish pie, the feast wouldn't be until Sunday night, when the owls began to fly in for last post. Ugh, Sirius groaned as a large brown eagle owl landed in front of him, one of the black family owls. I'll do it, James jumped in quickly, tugging the small scroll attached round the bird's scaly leg. He pushed his round glasses up on his nose and his eyes darted quickly across the paper. Then he shrugged and scrunched it up, tossing it over his shoulder. Just making sure you know you have to meet them at King's Cross. They're expecting you and Regulus to be together. Worried I'll pull another disappearing act, Sirius smirked. Uh, will you? Peter asked nervously. Not worth it, Sirius sighed. They'll be there early just to spite me. I'll have to come up with another way to piss them off. Or you could just try to keep your head down and make it through the summer, Remus suggested lightly, finishing his ice cream. Sirius just raised an eyebrow at him. Remus poked his tongue out. They both knew that was pretty much impossible, even if Sirius tried his very best. They didn't have very long to feel sorry for Sirius, however. Mary, who'd also received some post, let out a shriek, then burst into tears. The owl in front of her hopped back, alarmed, then gave an offended whoot and flapped away to the owlry. Mary! Lily and Marlene both said at once. What's wrong? Mary shook her head, apparently speechless, then covered her mouth and fled the dining hall. Lily and Marlene glanced at each other, then jumped up immediately to follow her. What do you think's up with her? Peter asked. Dreamer shrugged. Girl stuff! They didn't find out until later that evening. Mary was not in the common room, but Lily came down looking for a stray cardigan she'd left somewhere. Darren dumped her, she said gravely to Remus. She's a complete wreck, poor thing. Right before the holidays, Remus said, shocked. Bit harsh. Yeah, Lily replied sadly. Said he couldn't be bothered waiting around for her while she's at school all year. Wants a girlfriend closer to home. I think she's well shot of him. He sounds horrible. Bet Marlene's happy, though, Remus grinned. Won't have to hear about it any more. Don't bet on it, Lily's face was grimmed. She hasn't shut up about how much she loved him yet. Poor thing, Remus dug around in his pocket and withdrew his last sugar quill. Give her this. Tell her I hope she feels better, eh? Ah, you're sweet, Remus. Lily kissed him on the cheek, then headed upstairs again. She wasn't that upset when she broke up with me, Sirius muttered indignantly, moving a chess piece. Well, Remus shrugged, setting back down to the game. She dumped you, didn't she? I expected Stimfret when you're the one getting dumped. I wasn't that upset. I didn't think you and Mary were that serious. James yawned, playing Exploding Snap on the rug with Peter. You were only thirteen. Fourteen, Sirius corrected. But I take your point. Didn't really give it a fair go, did we? You weren't very mature about it, Peter murmured, thumbing through his cards. Well, no one ever caught us snogging in broom cupboards, you're right, 
Sirius snapped. Jealousy doesn't suit you, Black, Peter replied dryly. Oi, you all promised me the snogging thing was over, Remus said pointedly, giving him all a dark look. Don't knock it till you've tried it, Mooney, Peter grinned. <laughs>